Well, good morning to everybody here in Sacramento and to several hundred of colleagues who are joining from across the state. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first ever California Extreme Heat Symposium. My name is Wade Crowfoot and I lead our California Natural Resources Agency. And along with my partner, Sam Asafa, who leads the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, we are really excited to welcome you here today. Before we get underway, I wanted to take care of some housekeeping items. Um, we are several dozen of us here at the Natural Resources Agency headquarters in Sacramento, and several hundred more, as I said, joining via Zoom. Uh, for those uh, who are uh, joining by Zoom, the meeting is being interpreted in Spanish, so you can uh, hear and follow these discussions in Spanish. To access the audio channel for Spanish, please click the interpretation button at the bottom of your computer screen, the globe icon in the Zoom taskbar. The button will appear after uh, these instructions. So as I'm giving these instructions, I think the button will appear magically. Um, and these instructions will be repeated in Spanish, and then you will be able to join the Spanish language audio channel. Closed captioning is also available. And if you'd like to use this option, please click the closed caption icon in the Zoom taskbar and then select live transcript and see the full transcript on the side panel. On behalf of the teams, uh, Team OPR and Team Natural Resources uh, and our critical non-governmental partners, including Climate Resolve and so many others, um, thank you for being here today uh, and for sharing your experiences, your insights, your suggestions as we work collectively to stay ahead of the, th the threat of extreme heat in our communities uh, and across our state. We know that California's people, our places are on the front lines of climate change, wildfire, worsening drought, extreme heat. These are just uh, clear manifestations of this, this planetary crisis we face. Um, while much of the world knows the challenges that we're facing with wildfire and drought, less understand just how challenging the crisis of extreme heat is in our state. Just last month in September, we endured the hottest, longest heat wave in our state's history, literally breaking thousands of temperature records across our state and uh, creating a situation where we very nearly lost um, electric power in different parts of our state. We also know this had major impacts across California's communities that are not yet well documented. But amidst these challenges, California has a history and is a leader in actually addressing this crisis. Uh, extreme heat legislation, state law changes that we'll talk about here today, uh, industry innovation, uh, community activation, uh, folks, uh, folks that are joining this discussion today really come from all sectors, our public sector, our federal, state, local, tribal governments, community-based organizations on the ground, uh, helping Californians get through these impacts, scientists and academics that are better, uh, helping us to better understand the challenges that we face. Uh, and so that we're all here today to learn from each other and really to look forward. You know, just last month, Governor Newsom and the legislature agreed on a historic budget. Over the last two years, California state government is investing $54 billion in climate action. And a lot of this investment is about slashing our carbon pollution and moving toward carbon neutrality by 2045. And a lot of this funding is also about protecting California's communities from the impacts that are already here. And that funding is going to translate into continued progress. As I look around the room and we look on the roster of those joining by Zoom, we know there are a lot of leaders here today joining us who are delivering solutions, whether that's building community resilience centers to help Californians get through extreme heat, expanding tree canopy and green infrastructure projects, including those in California's schools, accelerating the deployment of air condition in underserved households, which is so critical given uh, the, the heat waves that we're experiencing, establishing a monitoring program to track climate sensitive health impacts and diseases across our health system, very much of a work in progress. 
Uh, right after lunch, we're going to be joined by one of our key state leaders that's driving all of this work, Assemblymember Luz Rivas, who authored historic legislation along with our insurance commissioner and her colleagues in the legislature that are establishing the first in the nation extreme heat ranking and warning system. We'll hear more about that. But look, at the end of the day, investments are only as good as the collaboration that we have and the effectiveness that we demonstrate on getting this this funding actually working to protect Californians. Uh, so we know that while industry experts create new cooling technologies, community leaders are building social and physical infrastructure, and scientists are helping to benchmark both the threat and our progress, we need to continue to improve our work together. And that's what the discussion is about today. It's about being honest with each other around uh, the, the, the challenge we face um, the progress we've made, but also the gaps that exist and what we have to work together on uh, and where we need to address challenges that we haven't yet addressed. So our goal today and a successful day is if we bring ourselves, bring each other along, both understanding uh, what we now face uh, regarding extreme heat, um, what's happening in the state and importantly across our communities, and then what needs to happen that's not yet happening. Um, I am so pleased that in partnership with OPR, our state agencies launched or published uh, an update to our extreme heat action plan earlier this year. Back in 2013, our state government established its first extreme heat action plan. And then the update earlier this year is really focused on specifically what we need to do moving forward to address extreme heat. That's a step forward, but we know we have to do a lot more. And it's how do we take this action plan that we have at the state? How do we learn from experts and communities getting work done on the ground? And then how do we turn that into more resilience to this uh, increasing challenge? Now, driving this effort in for uh, on behalf of the state government has been Governor Newsom. You know, as he, as he will explain, um, we have gone from a, a leadership uh, in California on uh, reducing carbon pollution, which is well established over 20 years, to being a world leader in really tackling these climate threats that we have right now. So I'm really pleased to introduce a video from Governor Newsom putting this day in context and sharing his thoughts on the challenges we face and the opportunities before us. Hey everybody, it's Governor Gavin Newsom here and uh, I'm honored that you've all taken the time to be here as we bring together experts like yourselves, climate scientists, community leaders, state agencies, and of course, state leaders uh, to take stock on what's happening here in our state. And that's the growing threat specifically around extreme heat. Of course, extreme drought, extreme weather, broadly defined. But this extreme heat that we're currently facing is rather extraordinary. And I just want to recognize that leadership appropriately uh, because not only have we recognized the problem, you're recognizing strategies and solutions, including a number of them, that I had the privilege of signing uh, through new legislative efforts just recently. I wanna specifically though, call out and thank Assembly Member Luz Rivas, uh, one of our great leaders, uh, who's also, by the way, headlining our symposium today. You know, together with um, all of you, we were able to set aside uh, about $865 million, new resources through our climate commitment to help California respond to and mitigate uh, this extreme heat. These actions, of course, are more urgent than ever. I know that sounds like platitude, but let me be more specific. Just last month, we saw the hottest, longest heat wave in our state's history, breaking thousands of temperature records across the state and over the Western United States, threatening the most vulnerable among us and, and threatening our confidence and trust in our capacity to, to, to thrive, not just survive, as it relates to the rate of change, particularly as it relates to climate change that we're all experiencing. And that's why uh, we're here. And that's why we released these new funds, but we also released an updated new strategy, a new plan we refer to as the Extreme Heat Action Plan, taking our ambition, moving it into action, bringing a plan, by the way, that was originally created in a world that no longer exists. Think about that, just 2013. Think about what we knew and what we now are living through just in a matter of years. So we've updated that original plan and we've emphasized now much stronger uh, in immediate action and preparation, like notifying example, uh, our most vulnerable communities before heat events occur and making sure that we can provide shelter and relief. Uh, relief, by the way, that includes a myriad of things, including 
just situational needs around air conditioning, but also more sustainable strategies like greening uh, and shading. These are unprecedented times, as I suggest, and our actions need to, to recognize that and the severity and urgency of this crisis. And like is the case with so many issues in the state, you know, a state whose population is larger than 21 state populations combined, one size fits all doesn't work to protect our diverse communities. And that's why we have to understand what the unique challenges and needs of communities, diverse, large and small, all up and down the state uh, uh, provide in terms of opportunities and, and responsibilities. So that's also a, a guiding frame and principle uh, to our efforts. So look, uh, I've spent enough time talking. You guys are the real leaders in this space. And so I just want to wish you all the best. Thank you again for your remarkable wisdom and stewardship and really look forward to partnering with each and every one of you uh, and all of our diverse communities throughout the state uh, over the course of the next many, many years. Take care, everybody. We are going to get underway with our discussions and we'll start with a panel focused on just the, the state of play regarding extreme heat in California and the challenge we face. I'd like to invite our panelists to the stage. Have a, Have a seat. seat. Welcome. Welcome. Thank it's great, great to, to thank, you thank you for being here in person. person. Uh, uh, Dr. Eisenman and I were talking, talking about what a strange concept to see each other in person and not be having this conversation on Zoom. Um, um, but it's a, it's a pleasure to have each of you here. Uh, let, me let me tell you uh, who has joined us. Um, we have Dr. David Eisenman, who is a leader at UCLA uh, in all things public health and actually leads two centers uh, focused on climate change at UCLA. We have, we have Dr. Dr. Rupa Basu, uh, who, le Basu uh, who leads um, our, our work on this topic at our Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment in our state, which is an important entity under our California Environmental Protection Agency, just to understand um, how uh, uh, different threats are impacting human health in California. And then we have Dr. Sasha Bershinov, who comes to us uh, from Scripps Institution uh, at, uh, in San Diego. Uh, and, and so, so we're, we're thankful, thankful to have, have you all as experts, experts to really help us level set our understanding of this phenomenon of climate change driven extreme heat. You know, we're joined uh, by folks who might, you know, be focused on this topic for a living or those that uh, have just now um, come to this topic. And so what I'm hoping we can do in the next 45 minutes to an hour is really to level set to take, take your, your scientific, scientific understanding, understanding and, and translate it, it so that, that we, we all continue on to the day as we're talking about solutions to these challenges with a pretty good understanding of the threats, threats we face. face. So with that, I wanted to turn to you first, uh, Sasha, to talk about this phenomenon. Now, heat waves are, of course, um, nothing new in, in human history. Uh, we experience uh, abnormal heat. What's different about now? What's different about this, this extreme heat we face in, in California across the world? And how does climate change play a role? Thank you for having me today. And glad to be with all of you. Um, yeah, I, I study extreme weather patterns and um, uh, regional weather and how it's related to climate variability and climate change how to understand these things better, predict and project them better. And um, uh, I started getting into heat wave research after the 2006 July heat wave, which at that time was the unprecedented event. Uh, and it was actually epidemiologists, uh, public health professionals such as Rupa, who were raising the issue because uh, they were trying to understand what made that heat wave so impactful on health. Um, and uh, so when we started looking, uh, we reconstructed uh, heat wave activity over decades. Uh, and I brought a slide to, to show uh, what that looked like. Uh, we basically see that, of course, in California, heat waves are becoming uh, more frequent, 
longer lasting, more spatially extensive, and more intense, as they are in most of the rest of the world. But in California, they're also changing flavor. They're becoming more humid and therefore more strongly expressed at night in minimum temperatures. So it doesn't cool down as much at night. You can actually see what the 2006 heat wave looked like. The blue colors there uh, represent those humid nighttime uh, heat waves that we're not really acclimated to in uh, California. Uh, typically, it gets hot during the day in heat waves, in historical heat waves in California, and, uh, and it cools off at night pretty efficiently. Uh, but in 2006, that didn't happen. And we can actually see that that trend towards great, more heat wave activity, but also more humid heat wave activity specifically uh, is continuing most certainly. And, uh, and uh, these humid heat waves are more impactful on human health and they uh, you know knowing about the change in the flavor of heat wave activity uh, certainly uh, gives us ideas about the challenges that we face in terms of mitigating their impact quick follow-up sasha can you talk about what we can expect moving forward and the role of climate change in that how you know for the folks that are tuning in today what can we expect in coming years and decades? Well, these trends uh, are certainly due to climate change and the heat waves among all weather extremes are the most directly impacted by, by uh, global warming. Uh, and, um, uh, and so in California, we can expect a continuation of the trend towards more heat wave activity and specifically more humid nighttime accentuated heat waves. Uh, how strong that trend is going to be, how quickly that trend is going to accelerate or whether it's going to level out. Uh, I actually brought another slide to show that, but it depends on what we do globally to mitigate uh, heat wave, uh, to, to, mit to mitigate uh, climate change. And you can see um, on these plots that uh, basically, um, you know, how much uh, heat wave frequency in this case increases in the future depends on what we do to mitigate climate change. So, for example, that red um, box plot, uh, th those darker box plots represent uh, heat wave activity projected in the future with business as usual uh, scenario. Uh, but uh, if we mitigate, we get less heat wave activity, but of course, uh, a trend in heat waves and specifically humid heat waves for California is baked in already. So what we do uh, to mitigate uh, will change the magnitude of that trend but uh, we are facing more heat waves in the future, no matter what. Thanks, Sasha. So key takeaways. Um, one, we're already experiencing more intense heat waves than in the past, particularly this phenomenon of uh, it staying warm at night, which is um, really challenging across the state. And the, the role or increasing humidity to that heat. So it's a wet heat, which is a little bit uh, more challenging or dangerous that you know, with global warming that's already built into the system, we will be experiencing a more intense extreme heat, but we have the power um, by taking climate action across the world um, to, you know, reduce that increase. And that it's not just that we are resigned to a specific fate, but our ability to cut carbon pollution, uh, if we can do that across the world, will help essentially reduce the increase or limit the increase in extreme heat. Um, is that fair? You know, the, these kinds of results basically give us an idea about uh, how much effort do we uh, do we expand in mitigating climate change globally, uh, and how much uh, we mitigate the impacts of what uh, of what's coming, even if we are very good at mitigating, uh, and uh, and how much we suffer because the less we 
adapt, adapt and the less, the less we mitigate, mitigate the more we suffer. suffer. That's not my fault. <laughs> well, let's, well, let's talk, talk about, about how extreme heat impacts Californians. Californians. Again, Again, you know, you know heat, heat waves, waves are, are, are nothing, nothing new. new. Um, across, across the country, the country or, or world, world but, but our, our, our understanding, understanding of how they can impact people is changing. Is changing. Now, David, David, you're an, an expert, expert in public, public health, health and, and so can you talk a little about, about, you know, why should we be concerned about extreme heat? heat? What are the threats to Californians and Americans? Yeah, so uh, well, and thank you, Secretary Crowfoot, for inviting me here today. You know, the impacts are multiple. First of all, we hear a lot about heat-related illnesses, and there's eight to 10 of them, depending on how you count them going from the mildest ones like a rash to the most severe that can kill you, a heat stroke. But really, these are just the pinnacle, uh, the smallest number of what really happens out there that really harms people. Heat really harms people, especially those who already have a chronic illness, people who have diabetes, asthma, kidney disease, lung disease, cardiac disease. And of course, there's a lot of that wherever we go as we get older and in our communities. And, and those, those people, people are predisposed to get sicker. sicker. Their asthma, asthma gets, gets worse, worse, their diabetes gets, gets worse, their kidney disease gets, gets worse when they're, they're overheated, overheated, when they can't sweat, sweat, for instance, when it gets too humid, and they dehydrate. So while we see increases in heat-related illness, we see a much, 10 times, I would say, magnitude increase in these uh, exacerbated chronic diseases. And they can show up in our ERs, in our emergency rooms, they can show up in our in hospitalizations, or they can show up as deaths. But those are just sort of, those are still the ones that we can count. Those are the harms that we can count. Then there are all these hidden harms that don't get counted as easily. Heat's been related, has been linked to mental health problems. So we see now studies that show greater risks of suicide, of aggressive uh, acts, including homicide, assaults. A great story is about, it's been shown that uh, baseball pitchers bean more batters on very hot days. Um, seasonally appropriate, yeah. Well, a little bit late for this in LA, but um, premature births are linked to extreme heat, workplace injuries. And then you have the more subtle things that I think are really underappreciated, which are impaired sleep. Impaired thinking, so that we see now studies that show that test scores go down in schools that are not air conditioned and experienced heat prior to the test. And I think those impaired thinking, that kind of hot under the collar that we always talked about, uh, that aggressiveness, um, that impaired sleep is probably linked to the mental health problems, but we're not really making that connection. So you asked, how is it really affecting Californians? The answer is we don't really know. And that's, and that's part, part of the problem. problem. So, so we've, we've done analysis, analysis at UCLA where we looked at 10 years worth of data on excess additional emergency room visits on extreme heat days. And we find that across California on any average extreme heat day, there are 8,000 additional emergency room visits across the state. 8,000 additional ER visits. That's just what we can count. And we also see that there are huge disparities across communities. So if you go to our website, uclaheatmaps.org, we track these excess ER visits at the zip code level. You'll see two zip codes that will be right next door to each other. They share the same weather, but one will have three times the rate of ER visits as the other does. And it has to do a lot with being uh, the less leafy, less shady, less rich community and health disparities and all kinds of historical inequities showing up in the ER. And to the point of this last heat wave, we still don't know across California or across its big cities, what was the harm? What were the numbers of ER visits? What were the number of deaths? What were the hospitalizations? We have real-time surveillance for COVID, other states can give us data on how many people died after a hurricane, but we don't have that in California. And that's really something we all need to demand quickly. That's a really good point and an important gap. And I want to come back to that. But Rupa, let me turn to you. You know, whenever I travel around the country or world, everyone always asks me about California wildfires because wildfires are so, you know, well, one, yeah, they're easy to communicate the danger of. 
via TV, um, but much less uh, heat and extreme heat. So, you know, as one of our state's leaders in really assessing health hazards, where does extreme heat rank in, in these severe threats? Thank you for the invitation to uh, be on this panel today. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So of all the climate change uh, related impacts, heat is a number one killer. And, um, you know, we hear about wildfires and uh, hurricanes in other parts of the country, and of course, drought. It's all related, um, you know, but heat is the one that we could measure pretty easily. And it's also one that we could um, quantify with health effects. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our heat work at uh, OEHA. I started back in 2005, and um, at that time, there really wasn't a lot of epi studies uh, done on heat and health. It was really um, a lot of uh, case reports from the MMWR, from the CDC, the uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Um, and so the connection really hadn't been made um, so much between heat and health. Just following heat waves, it would be there's this you know, number of counts um, that are related to uh, deaths following the heat waves. And that was really it. So I think we have come a long way in um, really identifying vulnerable populations and kind of figuring out what the mechanism could be um, in uh, looking at heat and uh, health impacts. And, um, and as uh, Dr. Eisenman uh, pointed out, uh, some of the populations at risk. So now in the last few years, we've focused a little bit more on wildfires. And that's just because obviously we've been so impacted by fires. And um, I think the relationship between heat and wildfires and also drought can't be overlooked. Half of the work that we've done at our in our section so far has been on air pollution. So very related to the wildfire work and the populations at risk are very similar from what we're seeing so far. So, um, you know, their pregnancy outcomes, the ER and hospitalizations, um, not surprisingly, it's more focused on respiratory diseases, but really we're seeing a lot of the same uh, types of populations are, who are impacted, the most vulnerable subgroups. Um, and I guess this happens regardless of whether we're talking about heat, wildfires, COVID, drought, um, and I think addressing these disparities is really important um, in California. But one last point that I want to bring up uh, before I move on is that uh, we talk a lot about extreme heat. And in California, what we found from our studies is that it doesn't really take extreme heat or heat waves to see these associations. The associations that we've found so far have just been from background levels of temperature and humidity a combination that we refer to as apparent temperature. We've seen a lot of health impacts and we're already seeing these health impacts in California. And of course, these are predicted to get worse over time. Um, but a lot of this is, uh, we, we can prevent a lot of this. And so that's what I think uh, some of our discussion will be most, uh, focused on. Wow, so two important points, a lot of important points, but I'll raise two that you, that I hear you making. One is the connectivity between these different threats. So, you know, we've had this challenge with toxic smoke from wildfires the last few years, and that's obviously a huge public health impact. But what I hear you saying is some of the same folks that are most vulnerable to that toxic smoke are also vulnerable to increased temperatures. And so, uh, as, as David shared, you know, there are folks living with all types of what I would know as pre-existing conditions that really find that, you know, their, their challenge is exacerbated by this combination. I'll throw in the fact that we have corrupt. Now, upwards of a million Californians that live in communities that don't have uh, reliable access to clean and safe drinking water. So you put that on there too. I have to imagine that's another um, stressor on, on someone's health. Uh, and then the other point I, I was interesting to hear you make is it's not just about these most intense heat waves uh, like the one we just experienced, but it's also about the sort of ticking up of the heat over time and the humidity and probably the nighttime as well that you see this kind of slow impact. So I want to uh, let folks know in the audience and on, on Zoom that we're going to entertain questions 
uh, from you here in just a couple of minutes. So if you are on Zoom, you can type the Q&A button or press the Q&A button, click the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen uh, and then type in a question. And then we've got colleagues here that are going to verbalize your question. And then I think we'll have an opportunity for uh, folks in the room to also uh, ask questions. Uh, but I wanted to key on two, two, two questions for you all that I wanna ask. Um, one is this question of gaps. You know, we want to be honest. We, we, while we're proud of the work that California is doing, we recognize that we need to do more given accelerated climate change and this risk. And so I want to talk a little bit about gaps. What would you, you know, if you had that magic wand, that proverbial magic wand, what information gaps um, would you want to fill? Either scientifically, um, you know, where climate temperatures or temperatures will increase or impacts on public health or, or people. So David, I want to call on you first because I think you've raised a really important critique, which is our inability to uh, pinpoint impacts in a quick way. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I think you know there was a Los Angeles Times article a few weeks ago uh, that I was in along with Jonathan Parfrey, and the uh, journalist asked me uh, asked the question was what was the health impacts of the last heat wave. And I said, astoundingly, we don't know, like I just said. And she said, is it possible that all that we've been doing in the state led to no deaths because Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, when they called in the coroner's office, when they called, they said they reported no heat-related deaths. I said, no, that's not possible um, because we haven't done enough and because there's no reason to believe that. We know from our data that there's approximately a dozen extra deaths every day in Los Angeles when there's heat and that that number expands on the second, third, and fourth, and fifth day. So going forward, as we start to roll out these programs, we need to have some metrics by which to judge our, our success or lack of success. Just like we have had with COVID, we can see if we're doing better. So we really need to have these surveillance systems in place very soon, and they need to be granular enough that we can see the improvements if they're going to be there. And we need to see the places where they're not improving so we can figure out what, why are we not improving there? And in the places where we're succeeding, we can then figure out what were the key ingredients that led to our success there. But without these metrics, we can't do that. Heat waves are unusual among disasters. I've been studying disasters for 20 years. And it's actually a real opportunity in the disaster field to baseline our um, where we are, because we're going to have repeatable events that are going to look somewhat the same kind of predictably. And that doesn't really happen in other like earthquakes or wildfires or even tornadoes or hurricanes. So we can actually see, we have the potential to see if all of our policies are going to make a difference in this disaster. Rupa, you're an epidemiologist, as I understand. From your perspective for state government, um, do you share the opinion that that's an important gap around understanding very specifically the outcomes or impacts of, of a heat wave? And do you think we can, or what are we doing to, to address that gap? Yes, um, as an epidemiologist, a lot of our studies have been very large scale, population based studies. And um, you know, we look at health impacts for an entire climate zone or a region or even a county. We try to get, uh, you know, look at smaller spatial scales than that, but it's it's hard to really make sense of those of that data. But I think we have done, you know, collectively a great job of identifying these high risk populations. Now we need to figure out ways to prevent, uh, as I said earlier, the, a lot of these heat related deaths, deaths and illnesses and uh, deaths from other causes from heat are totally preventable. So if we can put in, you know, guidelines, um, really work locally, um, it's really important to take these big picture results and apply them to small scale community level uh, areas. And we've already identified high risk areas and I think um, by putting together some guidelines statewide and then really focusing on these high risk populations, we could um, really make a huge impact. Well, I appreciate, you know, both 
of, of your suggestions about what we need to do. And I'll mention that this legislation that just passed that the governor signed that Luce Rivas authored is really about, among other things, naming these events. You know, the hurricanes are named. The hurricanes, to your point, David, really easily understood how many houses destroyed, how many people killed. And as a result, it gains a lot of attention and a lot of response. Heat waves, not so, to your point. Heat waves, much more subtle. One of the things that we can do is one, really call out these extreme heat events as the, as the you know, finite extreme weather events that they are, but then also really seek to develop metrics so we can measure the impacts of those specific events. Sasha, I wanna ask you a challenging question. You're, you're somebody who's really digging into the intersection of climate change and heat, and it involves a lot of really complicated modeling and monitoring. You shared us with, with us some really understandable graphs, but, but based on so much scientific complexity. So if you're somebody sitting in the audience or joining by Zoom today, and you're a community leader that really understands that your community has real vulnerability to these heat waves, um, but really trying to understand, look around the corner and and understand what this is going to look like in 2030 or 2040 or 2050. How do you suggest that the layperson actually, you know, interact with um, kind of information that that you and others are sharing? And and what should that information inform uh, in terms of how they're planning moving forward? Well, thanks for that question, Wade. Um, yeah, I mean, the the science of climate change is actually not all that complicated. Uh, but, uh, but when, when we, we get, get into the nitty gritty, gritty the, details the details that we need to make intelligent, intelligent decisions, decisions to, to, to do something, something about either mitigation or adaptation, or adaptation uh, uh, it, it gets, gets more complicated. complicated. Um, and, and um, um, you know, I, I think, think that, that um, uh, for, for, for one, one thing, thing uh, we're missing a universal, universal holistic, holistic definition, definition of what a heat wave is. is. You know, right, right now, now uh, heat waves are defined uh, according, according to, you know, their tailored definitions for specific impacts. Uh, but, uh, you know, and even for different communities at the local level that Rupa was just talking about, you know, you need different definitions to get at the impacts there. Um, I think we need a more holistic definition that should include at least the duration the total magnitude and the maximum intensity of a heat wave, at least those three things to define events. Uh, and, and then we, we can relate those uh, elements to impacts pretty much anywhere and on any community. And we're actually beginning to work with mathematicians to develop these and apply these types of probability models that, that can encapsulate events in this uh in this in this, in this way. way um and um and then you know we need to understand uh how we def you know what, what is extreme you know what what the way that uh, heat waves were defined in those plots were basically the five percent of the hottest days in summer or hottest nights in summer um and uh uh you know extreme events are basically large rare events but, but as, as uh, uh, global warming uh, continues, then heat waves, you know, right now we already have uh, probably twice, uh, you know, like what, what used to be 5% the hottest days, according to the same threshold, is more like 10% of, of the days. And, 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 you know, it's becoming more commonplace. And in the future, uh, there will be, uh, you know, it'll be three to four times. Or, or four to five times if we look at nighttime expressions of heat waves in the mid-century and much more than that uh, later. So uh, what do we do with that information, especially knowing the changes in the flavor of heat waves? You know, can you tell people to go to cooling centers when it's hot at night, for example? You know, what do you do about that? So uh, I have another excellent epidemiologist colleague besides Rupa, who is also our common colleague, Tariq Benmarnia at uh, UCSD, who has a great idea about how to make these, uh, uh, you know, cooling centers into community centers where people would actually want to go and interact with other members of the community. Um, 
And, uh, you know, so what do we do with that information? Uh, another thing is um, compounded impacts that were mentioned already, especially with wildfire. You know, heat, just warming, and certainly heat waves, they suck moisture out of out of the ecosystems and, and make them more flammable. They, they also aggravate drought, uh, but, but uh, they dry out the fuels. And so wildfires are certainly becoming also much more intense, and they burn a lot more uh, area. Uh, in California and all over the world. And um, um, and uh, in California, there are actually three types of heat waves. Uh, dry summertime, humid summertime heat waves, and then very coastal heat waves that are associated with Santa Ana and Diablo winds. Uh, and those are actually uh, fall, winter, and spring heat waves that also impact human health even outside of summer. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, they they also are the fire weather that, that drive the, the biggest wildfires in the coastal zone, and they blow the smoke, um, you know, from where the fires are blowing, typically in the backcountry where not that many people live. Obviously, the direct impacts of wildfires are devastating there, but but not that many people live there. But the smoke is then blown to uh, the coastal zone where most of the people live. Um, and, and so what we need to know more about as, you know, <laughs> including any other things is, uh, how do these impacts compound? We do know, for example, that smoke from wildfires is several times more impactful to human respiratory health than similar levels of pollution from other sources. So, you know, the, I'm just beginning to scratch the surface here <laughs> and I better stop. Really good point. So important areas of increased understanding, understanding compounding impacts of these challenges that we face a little bit more in terms of defining um, extreme heat so we can understand the different types of these extreme events. But to Rupa's point, we also recognize that, you know, gradual or increased temperatures that aren't necessarily in an extreme heat wave have impacts as well. To me there, you know, we, we can't be paralyzed by the, the, that which we don't know. We know there are still things we need to do. You know, for a school in Los Angeles that has, um, you know, mostly blacktop and no shade, we know that's a problem as temperatures increase. We know there's there's actions that we need to take. And I want to make sure that, you know, our moving forward as we fill these gaps, whether it's very specific impacts of events or the, the way heat is manifesting across the state, that we really stay connected to the folks on the ground doing the work so we can all move together in our understanding. I want to move to Q&A from uh, participants who are joining by Zoom. So I turn to Taylor to share a question. Thank you, Wade. So our first question is from Fred Schwartz. What sectors do you expect heat to impact the most? What sectors? So we could call them economic sectors, let's say like agriculture or healthcare. Um, anybody want to take a crack? We talked a lot about public health impacts. We talked less about economics. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to talk about economics, but I'm going to say from a health point of view, we can say that uh, one of the sectors that's uh, really important is um, manufacturing and warehousing. Um, we talk a lot about outdoor workers, and that's very important. We've spent a lot, a lot less time about the indoor workers who are working under outdoor conditions. These big box warehouses where there's no air conditioning and temperatures can reach 90 and higher, where studies have shown higher workplace injuries. And that because it's either because of heat at the moment or the compounded experience of, of heat and not sleeping well, as I talked about poor sleep, but workplace injuries uh, in those places are, are obviously, you know, a big part of our economy now in California and uh, not as far as I know, uh, getting enough attention. Appreciate that. Just given the interest of time, let's move to another question. There we go. Okay, so from David, older adults face the most detrimental health outcomes in extreme heat events. Have there been any age specific studies on extreme heat events in California? And if so, what are some insights? Actually, I would say that older adults are definitely impacted, um, but 
other populations may be at higher risk. So if you uh, look, of course, at the number of older individuals impacted, yes, maybe the numbers could be um, you know, quite high, but we can't forget about other age groups because uh, I think when we first started doing these studies, it was really just elderly impacts on heat. And as we started to explore some more, we realized that impacts on pregnant women, for example, are much greater, um, young athletes, middle-aged uh, outdoor workers. These are all um, very high-risk populations, but often get um, overlooked. When we talk about heat alerts, it's really important to include these populations because many times they don't realize they're at high risk. So um, yeah, I wanna make sure that we kind of are inclusive of, of all age groups because it isn't really just an issue among um, older people. You know, I, I remember when I started working on heat waves, as I said, it was in the aftermath of the July 2006 heat wave. Um, and I and I remember specifically that uh, uh, out of the people who died, most of them were elderly living alone. Some had functioning air conditioning, but they didn't turn it on. And maybe they were expecting it to cool down at night as it typically does uh, in their memories. Um, and maybe, you know, because also the vast majority of these people lived in poor neighborhoods, uh, they couldn't afford to run their air conditioning. Uh, uh, but about, I think, 20 or 30 percent of the people who died were in their 20s and 30s and healthy. And guess what they were doing? Well, you know, they were, they were farm workers. So uh, so there you go. Yeah, it, it is not just elderly people living alone. Thanks so much. We have time for one or two more questions. Our next question is from Arsenio Mataka. So Rupa mentioned OEHA has identified high-risk areas for extreme heat. How are these areas identified and what granularity are you able to focus on? First of all, huge honor to have Arsenio Mataka join us. He's one of our federal leaders um, working on uh, impacts uh, to disadvantaged communities uh, on behalf of the Biden-Harris administration. So Rupa, that was a really specific question. You want to take a crack? Okay, so, so we have, we have looked, looked at areas, maybe a little bit more, I guess, spatially larger than what we need to look at, but um, the comparisons that I can make are between Northern and Southern California, for example, or coastal and non-coastal areas. Um, we've really noticed that there's a difference between coastal and non-coastal areas. Coastal areas are often more impacted um, just because people living in those areas have not acclimated to the heat. So even a you know, fairly you know, mild day could actually constitute extreme heat or heat wave or even just high levels of heat exposure that are enough to see some of these health impacts. Also in California, we have so many microclimates. So even if we're looking at coastal areas, um, you know, if you compare San Francisco, for example, versus Oakland, um, you can see that the temperatures are so different, the populations are so different. And so the impact is, um, it really needs to be kind of looked at this in a local scale. We haven't really done that so um, to, th to that level yet, but we do need to, uh, I mean, we could put some maps together to really um, look at that. And um, it's something like the, the chat tool would, would do that. I just wanna add, um, refer, listeners to uclaheatmaps.org, where we looked at 10 years worth of emergency room visits, comparing heat days to non-heat days at the zip code level. So you can see what you just talked about, which is some of the northern counties are have exceedingly high rates of ER visits on these heat days. But then you also see these two communities, like I say, right next to each other, two zip codes, and one will have three times the rate of the other at the zip code level. And this gets at what people can do. They can look at those maps and they can call their Congress people and they can call their local public health department and emergency management and say, what are you doing for my zip code? And we can start to actually push our policymakers and our program leaders in the state at the local level saying, what's going on in our community? Why are we three times the rate? Yeah, it's worth repeating. So two zip codes right next to each other experience the same extreme heat event 
one zip code has three times the number of emergency room visits as the other zip code. Three times the rate. Got it. So uh, attributable to that extreme heat event, three times the rate uh, of, of these health acute health challenges. And that really speaks to one of the key themes of today, which is understanding how we help the most vulnerable communities to extreme heat. Um, I want to thank each of you for the work that you've done and for getting us off to a great start to really level set our understanding of the challenges of extreme heat. Uh, if there are participants here today that have questions that went unanswered, if you're joining by Zoom, please do put those in the Q&A box because we're, we're recording those questions and that can then inform how we report out on today and questions we can answer. And if you're in the room and didn't have an opportunity to ask a question, please go to one of our organizers and make sure that you get that question uh, submitted. Um, when, I, when we get off the stage, we're next going to invite up a good friend and colleague of ours, Dan Jacobson, who leads Environment California. And Dan's going to take us on a bit of a deep dive around the challenges to our energy system, our electrical grid from uh, extreme heat. Uh, and then after that, uh, for the rest of the day, we'll then shift into solutions. What are we doing? What do we need to do to address the challenges we face? Please join me in thanking our panelists here today for a wonderful conversation. And if Dan's panelists can come up, we'd appreciate that. And as our next panel um, gets situated on stage, for those joining us in person, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please write it on a comment card. Those are at the registration desks, or we'll have a staff member walking around with some extras. And then raise that comment card during the panel, and we'll come and collect it from you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. My name is Dan Jacobson. I'm a senior advisor uh, to Environment California, and it's not every day you have the honor of being introduced by the secretary, Mr. Wade Crowfoot. So, secretary, it's always a pleasure to work with you and uh, obviously to be introduced by you. Um, I have the privilege, really, of moderating a panel that looks at uh, the issue of extreme heat and of grid reliability. And if you're like me, there's two things that you want to do first, which is the first thing is to thank a lot of the people in this room and who are on Zoom who probably um, saved your tuchus, as my dad would have said a couple of weeks ago when the state was just on the verge of running into blackouts and these people were working really 24 seven to make sure that the lights stayed on. So if you're one of those people, pat yourself on the back or have someone else pat you on the back. Uh, because really you did a lot of work to make sure that that happens. The other person that I want to thank is probably myself and every single person in the room, because I know that when I got that Amber alert, I kind of jumped like that and was like, holy moly, I better do something quick and immediately went and told my daughters, you have to turn everything off in your room. And, and I like to think that I was part of the solution too. And I think that's really what it's going to take here moving forward is not just sort of the genius of, of sort of our state and, and some of the smartest people that we have to be able to work forward, but also individuals getting involved too. And how do we marry those two things together? So the issue that we want to talk about here today is really that extreme heat and grid reliability. And we've asked these three experts in their own fields to sort of come up and to be able to talk about that. I'm, I'm going to give the mic to each of them, and we've asked them to introduce themselves, 
talk for maybe 20 seconds about who they are, but then get into sort of an overview about what extreme heat and grid reliability sort of means to them and, and how they look at this. And then we're going to go back and forth with a couple of questions. Um, and then again, if people have questions in the audience, you can ask them um, by raising your hand and someone will come by and give you a, a card if you're on Zoom. And there is one of the cards looks like and there's one of the people so you can see the whole thing. If you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A function and we've got people who are going to monitor that and be able to um, push some questions there. And I really would encourage people to ask those questions because we want to make sure, A, that we can have an interactive session, but B, if we don't get them, uh, those questions will help us as we move afterwards. So first, let me hand it over to the Vice Chair of the California Energy Commission, Mr. Siva Gunn. Thank you, uh, Dan. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity, Amanda, uh, to be here today and be a part of this conversation. Secretary Crawford, thank you for your leadership, not just on the energy field, but the overarching area of natural resources and the enormity of that work, uh, especially at this time. Thank you for your leadership. And I want to thank uh, my panelists, uh, fellow panelists here. I see some colleagues. Uh, from the past, which is awesome. But also, as Dan mentioned, uh, just a big shout out to every single staff member across a, a multitude of agencies, not that the CEC, uh, but CPUC, CAISO, DWR, um, it's so many agencies were involved in making sure we rode through the heat wave and also everybody in California who turned off their lights, but every single stakeholder that brought solutions to the table, um, you know, IOUs, POUs, water agencies, you know, you know, we can't name everybody here, but it was a collective effort um, under um, the, the coordination of GEO. So I just wanted to say a big thank you first uh, about September 6th, especially, and then move into the conversation. So as Dan mentioned, um, I'm Siva Gunda, I'm the Vice Chair of the California Energy Commission, and my uh, responsibility and role at CEC is to work on reliability and resource planning, which is the SB100 uh, goals of uh, California. So I wanted to kind of set the stage at a top level on what has happened since 2020 heat wave, um, and just at the stage of how the agencies have been working together to plan for heat waves and what it means to the grid, and then pass it on to Delphine to kind of get into more, um, you know, from the operational standpoint and, you know, one of our critical um, the participants and stakeholders, Dale, to talk about the water side. So at a 30,000 foot level, I think it'll be helpful to just frame this in broadly four buckets as, as we talk about um, the electricity system planning. So first, and obviously it starts with the planning. And then when we say about planning, you're talking about you know, all the assumptions that go in, into the planning of an electric system. So you're talking about what could be the demand forecast uh, that you experience, not just on an average sense, but in extreme heat events. So that's the first one. And the, import, the, the problem with that right now is we really do not have historical information to rely on like we always do. We look at history and say, this is how the demand forecast is gonna be projected based on some of the other variables like economic demographic variables and such. But right now we're in this paradigm where we don't have any historical data to really think about what the future is gonna be in terms of electric demand. Now, when we talk about electric demand, it's about how much, where, and when, right? So you, you wanna talk about the magnitude of the, of the demand, but where in California is it going to happen, right? It depends if it happens on the coast or if it happens in a load pocket where you might not have transmission or, or local constraints. So that's an issue. And when is when are you going to get the peak load, right? So, you know, especially as we go into the uncertainties of, you know, electrification, whether it be our transportation and, and buildings. So that's a whole conundrum that we're really trying to figure out is how best to understand the demand side of the planning. And then comes the supply side of the planning. So now once you understand what demand you're gonna be, the demand on the grid's gonna be, then you need to figure out how best are you going to forecast supply of hydro conditions, supply of imports coming into the state, supply of solar and wind, and how do they vary under extreme heat conditions? Or would a fire knock out a transmission line coming into the state so we suddenly lose 4,000 megawatts of import capability like what happened last year. So that's on the supply side. You're trying to understand you know, demand and supply conditions in your planning, one from an average conditions, and I'll tell you why it's important from an average conditions, and then also extreme conditions. So that's the planning part. 
So once you plan, you know, given our long-term goals we have, like SB100, which is 100% retail sales in California coming from clean energy resources or zero carbon resources, then you need to figure out how are we going to make sure we are doing the necessary procurement, right? Authorizing the procurement to make sure we're meeting that demand and supply situation, right? So that's the second part. And the third part, which we are continuing to get more and more pulled into and has been very difficult and challenging is, even if you were to procure, are you able to build as fast as you want to, right? So can you put steel in the ground? So if you look at the supply chain constraints, now we are in a global economy right now, something happens in, China or Taiwan or you know somewhere else where we source our materials from, any of that things could disrupt our climate goals in California. And that's the reality that we need to work in. So that comes the delays. How do you make sure we are able to build as fast as we need to? And then finally, even if you were to build and you plan for all this stuff, how are you going to continue to cover extreme situations in California? So those are like the broad four things, and, and those four things have been evolving since 2020. So just a couple of examples. In 2020, after we came out of uh, the, the shortfalls in on the 14th and 15th, we understood that the extreme situation to be a certain thing, and that really changed and continues to change every single day. And that's the problem we are trying to work through, and I look forward to the discussion to answer questions in those four teams. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot and CNRA and OPR for uh, hosting this really critical event. I want to echo everything that Vice Chair Gunda said, all those really critical, important things uh, for the California ISO. So I am Delphine Holm, Director of California, uh, Director of Regulatory Affairs at the California Independent System Operator. For those of you who don't know us, we operate the grid for about 80% of the state of California, uh, the other 20% largely covered by the larger immunities like SMUD or LA. Uh, but we definitely work with them as partners uh, in uh, our balancing authority functions, which is just a wonky way of saying we make sure the supply and the demand meet so that you get electricity. So that's the layman's term. But I want to, to pull a thread from what Vice Chair said, and that is planning, planning, planning. It is critical that as we operate the grid, as we're in there looking at the minute by minute analysis of what is coming in, that we have already planned for this well in advance. I'll give you a completely different example. Think back in 2018, we had the solar eclipse, you know, we got those fancy glasses so you don't burn out your retinas. But what was happening at the Kaiso is we spent a year planning for that, training our operators, going through drills, going through sessions, calling Germany, who had already gone through it because they have a large solar penetration. What would happen to the grid if that much solar got knocked out in one fell swoop? So you've got a massive ramp down of solar, and then we had to push other energy up. And suddenly, as the eclipse ended, you have a huge ramp up of energy again from solar, and then we had to ramp everything down. So that was an incredibly important exercise for our operators to know what to do, what are the contingencies, and we planned that for a year. And we already knew it was coming. So when we were talking about extreme heat, this is exactly what Vice Chair Gunda was saying is our historical is not going to give us a very clear picture. We're already seeing that in the near term data. What we're finding is that the extreme heats are hotter and hotter. As the last panel mentioned, the night times are not cooling off. So that increases the heat dome and that pushes up energy demand the next day and the next day. So you have these heat waves that are not just one or two days, but they're three, four, five days. And again, the human impact of that, but also as a grid operator, the physical impact on our actual infrastructure. Generators might not be able to withstand that kind of heat and still operate transmission lines, distribution lines. We have drought, you know, everything across the system needs to really be considered and planned for. So that's why the generation part is also extremely important to us. Now we've been adding generation by leaps and bounds, even with the supply chain issues that Vice Chair Gunda has said. But one thing we need to keep in a balance is solar, for example, is critically important to our system these days. We have about 14,000 megawatts of installed solar on the uh, wholesale large scale side. I think another 10,000 on the distribution side for rooftop panels. So when you think about that right now, what we've generally said is great. We'd love to pull that solar later into the day so that it can serve our load in the evening. 
but we really only have about 4,000 megawatts of storage at the moment. So there is a little bit of an imbalance that we need to plan for and catch up to. But again, one other thing, the last thing I want to notice and a nuance here is we have so much solar but less so in the summertime because it's actively being used by the load. In spring and fall, we have a lot of what we've called excess energy, but as we electrify, as we add more uh, air conditioning, for example, because the coastal regions are heating up, a lot of that solar is being actively used. So the question is, you put more storage on the system, what's charging the storage? So that's another issue that we're contemplating and working very closely on with the regulatory agencies that do procurement so that we at the CAISO can do the transmission planning to make sure all of those resources are connected. And then operationally, how are we working with stakeholders, with our partners, with resource generators, et cetera, to make sure that we are able to operate through these extreme events? Thank you. Dale. Great, nicely, nicely done. done. Thanks, Thanks for having me, everybody. Um, um, my name is Dale Roberts. I'm a principal engineer at Sonoma County Water Agency. Our nickname is Sonoma Water. Some call us So What. Um, but. Um, Thanks for having me. Um, I manage our energy resources and climate resiliency group. Uh, at the Sonoma Water, we do water supply, wastewater, and flood control. I'm going to mostly talk about our water system because that's where we have the most uh, flexibility, if you will. Um, our main goal uh, during normal operations, like most businesses, is to deliver uh, our product, clean, potable water, uh, cost effectively with minimal environmental impact. Um, so the way we do that is we withdraw water from the Russian River, deliver it to uh, the community, you know, filter it through sands and gravels. Uh, we're going to change the name of the river from Russian River to something else. It's got a bad taste in its mouth right now. Um, but that's our normal operation. When we're called upon during heat waves and grid stressor events like a flex alert or even PG&E's uh, PSPS events, um, we have to change that steady withdrawal. We do have some capacity in our system uh, with redundant pumps down at the river and excess storage in our tanks on top of the hills that pressurize the whole system. So we've, we've experimented with load shifting a bit, you know, pumping more in the middle of the day when power is plentiful, um, as Sir Sheen was saying, um, and then stopping pumping in the evening time uh, when, when uh, power is, is scarce. Uh, but that takes some uh, planning ahead, that takes some uh, more uh, manual labor than the cost savings of the price of energy at that time. We, we're, we're used to just doing it steadily. Uh, when, when we shift that operation, we need to stand, send more people in the field to modify uh, disinfection systems, some chlorine systems and the like, uh, modify some valving and the like. We don't have that all automated. We're looking, because of these recent events, uh, back in 2020, when it was pretty sudden, and more recently back in... Uh, early September um, during the heat wave. Uh, we're looking to automate those, but it does take a little more effort. But I think there are opportunities there. Uh, but for us, uh, because we're a relatively conservative industry, our job is to deliver clean water, that's it. Uh, we pride ourselves on getting our power from renewable sources, um, uh, mostly hydropower, but some geothermal as well. Um, and uh, we want to continue to do that. So we we do have a progressive board, and they are proactive. Uh, but our primary purpose on the water side is to deliver the clean water uh, effectively. And it can be a distraction without uh, planning it, as uh, the other panelists were talking about. And so we have been working together. We expect this to happen in the future. Uh, so for us. Uh, what we need um, is notice and certainty on pricing and the like. Uh, if it's we, we get these notices and we get the maybe, it might be cutting back on power. We might need you to cut back. Just tell me you need to or not, because uh, I want to put out the effort. I want it to be worth our while. Just I know you have to deal with uh, market prices and the like, uh, but just tell me what it's. I'm going to get paid, or tell me what I'm going to get reduced, or what have you, and that would make uh, 
make us the industry, not just Sonoma Water, but the industry in general, more amenable to make those changes. There are opportunities there. We also, I want to point out, uh, do power generation on the hydropower side at our Lake Sonoma uh, Reservoir. We have a hydro turbine that uh, we is a run of the river, so we can't ramp it up and slow it down because of uh, endangered species, uh, coho and steelhead and the like. Uh, but Oddly enough, there's an opportunity there. It's not quite cost effective yet to put a battery there and store the daytime power in the battery. Then in the evening time, we have enough capacity in the switch gear and the um, uh, and the generator and the like in the um, the interconnection to put the run of the river onto the grid plus what was stored in the battery in that window of time. Same thing with the consumption side. So I think there are opportunities rather than uh, on the distribution scale to uh, if we can incentivize uh, batteries um, and storage capability, we have a lot of opportunity on both the consumption side and on the production side to balance and optimize uh, these these changes that we're seeing and that we need to respond to during these heat waves. Um, and I'll leave it at that. How's that? Okay, that's cool. And that's a lot of good information. I think everyone here will remember with me, there were a couple times this past spring when we looked at the Kaiso app, which I bet almost all of us have on our phone, and we were pretty excited to see it was at 100%. And sometimes it was over 100%, which seemed like, how do you be over 100%? But that was awesome. Um, but there's still so many challenges that the state faces. I mean, it's estimated that we have to put seven gigawatts of clean energy and storage onto the grid every single year and that would more than probably double or triple what we've done in our best years. So the question then becomes, if we're looking at next year, what are the, what are the practical things that we can do? What are the things that people in this audience will then write down and say, okay, I'm gonna work with this agency to do this, or I'm gonna find a state legislator and introduce this bill, but, but, but for next year, for 2023, and I know that you and I had talked and you said, well, we need seven, and I hope I'm not spilling the state secret if you say we've got three and so we need four. <laughs> and so my question to you all is sort of where do those four come in 2023 and in 2024? And then the next question I'm going to ask is sort of then looking longer term, what what realistically can we do right now? Yeah, thanks, Dan. I think um, that's that's really well set up. Um, so just wanted to talk through a couple of uh, contextual points that you just mentioned. So in over the last four months, uh, you know, for those of you who have been closely tracking the legislative cycle, um, we started with an early assessment of what the summer would look like, what the next five years would look like in May timeframe. And what we've come down to is, you know, going back to the buckets that I mentioned earlier, whether it's planning, you're you're not procuring enough, you know, even though you're planning for it, I mean, you know how much you should procure, but you haven't authorized the procurement. And then even if you authorize them, you haven't, you're not able to build it fast enough. And then even if you are building it fast enough to the planning standards, you will not be able to cover what happened this summer, right? So those are the kind of things. So what we have you know, come up with, you know, as, as um, Dan just mentioned, if you put all those issues and you stack them and you say, this is the worst case scenario that we could experience, we're looking at anywhere from 7,000 to 10,000 megawatts of potential shortfall. That's the magnitude we're talking about. So we just saw that happen in 2022. We, we got through it, you know, because of extraordinary actions, especially, you know, Dan turning off his lights and me, you know, I didn't have the chance to turn off the lights. I was actually cut off power. So it was easier to make the choice. Um, so, you know, we, we went through a 7,000, but we could experience as much as 10,000 in 2025. So then the question is, what can we do, right? So the first, I mean, there's two elements of the, two, two sides of the story. You have to manage your demand and you have to increase your supply. So when we talk about demand, there are a multitude of things we can do in demand response and demand flexibility. Like what happened on September 6th at 5.45, as Dan mentioned, there, there was this uh, text message alert, Amber Alert went out and the Californians collectively dropped over 2000 megawatts of load in less than 20 minutes. 
right? So that's two gigs. So if we were to presume that that is that is the kind of levels of magnitude of DR that's available out there, how do you make sure you maximize the opportunity for not just DR, but demand side resources as a whole, including B2G, including behind the meter storage, including being able to flex your load in a way that it's not uncomfortable. You know, you are able to uh, cycle your air conditioning a little bit better. You're able to cycle your um, water heaters a little better, those that are electric. So how best to do that, right? So that's the demand side equation. And there is plenty, thousands of megawatts there that we could, we could tap into. And on the supply side, how do you ensure that you're procuring a little bit more than you probably need for a little while? So that you could push the, the certainty in the market that we don't go into this boom and bust cycles where we build 1,000 megawatts this year. Next year, we say there's nothing. The following year, the procurement is 4,000. So how do you manage it in a way that the boom and bus cycles don't happen and the market has certainty to keep building them? So that's that's what I mean. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'll, I'll pull on a couple of those threads and maybe add one more. Um, completely agree with you on really kind of looking at on um, kind of really bringing out that demand potential. And I, I really just want to say hats off to both the CEC and now also the PUC for embarking on really aggressive, I think, load management standards um, and pathways for consumers to participate by leveraging a lot of automation and technology. I'm in the energy industry. I do not want to stare at my electric bill or my rates at all. So I can't imagine for the regular consumer there's any interest in, in doing that. But if we are able to leverage, for example, the Google Nest, the Alexas at home, have that integrated with the home so that we're modulating things, maybe something small, like increasing the temperature in the refrigerator for a few hours during a flex alert, hopefully something where the consumer doesn't even notice it's going on, it's not inconveniencing them, it's not asking them to really shut everything down. That I think will get a lot more better and consistent response than these sort of you know hard lever emergency calls. Now we're incredibly grateful for everything that everyone did this past heat wave, but we also know that once you have that Cal OES call, you cannot call it day after day after day. What we have learned in calling the flex alerts for the last 20 years is that over multiple days, there is fatigue. Right, and it does require a lot of manual action. And so the wor good work that the CEC is doing now, the PUC doing, is trying to automate that, but also trying to link it to the KISO market where we do have pricing signals. For example, if the prices are high, not a good time to use electricity. When the prices are low, that would be the good time to use electricity or charge your electric vehicle. Or, you know, there's more and more other facilities that can really modulate their usage. And so there's a lot of latent capacity there that could be leveraged. The other thing I want to touch upon is, you know, on the building side, absolutely agree. We have in our generation queue to try to interconnect to the KISO over a hundred gigawatts and people think well if that's true then why are we in a supply shortfall how can that be so it's because you have a lot of developers with interest but there is no counterparty there isn't the authorization to actually go out and sign the contracts and pay the money so you have a lot of developers waiting in line without a lot of differentiation of well which one is mature and can move forward which one is very speculative um, and just sort of trying to see what they can get so i think movements like what we had this uh, past session in sb 1020 where you know providing kaiso some information about you know where those contracts may be going so that we can really kind of do that matching that is going to be very powerful for the KISO to be able to move projects forward in a timely manner to kind of match where their procurement is going. And lastly, I'll say another really um, a good area we want to explore further, and we uh, started on this a little bit, is also working with folks like Dale um, in terms of uh, having more communication with especially water users or other um, uh, supply resources on the grid that maybe we don't coordinate and communicate on the day to day, but on a massive heat wave like this, if we can give you four to seven days heads up so that you can reconfigure your water system so that you can get everything ready, make sure you're adhering to your environmental and your you know facility requirements, but also doing what you can to help the grid and electricity management. 
that I think would be a really great relationship. There's certainty for you. There is some assurance for us of like latent capacity. And we really saw that come in and through the good work of the CEC as well, of trying to bring those water users into that conversation. I think we were able to already see this past summer some of the benefits of that. And I think we can do better and improve on that and get more communication and coordination going so that it's it's you know better for both of us. Thanks. Brilliant. Yeah, There's music, music to my ears. Might, might as well <laughs> sing it next time. That was good. Um, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, what Steve and Delphine both said. Um, uh, I, I guess I would just, um, uh, yeah, just emphasize um, more, more planning ahead would be very helpful, knowing that it's coming. Um, I will add, I do think when you say, uh, Dan, what's possible in the next year or two, um, to build something for us anyways, as a public entity, we move it the speed of government. So getting something built in the next year or two takes us a good year to design, takes us a good year to you know, follow the public contract code. It's good to have the public contract code. It means uh, no boss tweeds out there. But so uh, in line with Delphine was saying, take advantage of the existing infrastructure that's out there and leverage that, leverage what we can. Let's, it's, a, it's automation. Uh, the, the energy savings could be there. It's just being creative in, in using it and load shifting appropriately such that all the businesses out there, uh, buildings or what have you, um, can continue to operate effectively, but simple little changes, you know, thermostats and the like, uh, freezers and the like. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. On the water side, we're exploring um, existing uh, recycled water systems. We have ponds that usually wastewater treatment plants and the like. We clean the water and distribute it to farmers' ponds and stores there, and they irrigate their system. A little water nerdiness for you. But we're looking at, okay, we have this infrastructure sitting in the wintertime, and let's just let that run back to the treatment plant and spin a turbine there. It's not a lot of power, but at least you're getting something and using existing infrastructure that's already built. So that's why I think of when you say, what can you do in the next year? Take advantage of what's already there. There's a lot of opportunities there. Just think a little more innovatively, a little more creatively in making that work um, to either produce power or conserve power or the like. So let's hope we can do that. OK, before we move to the next question, though, I just want to tease that out a little bit because I really want to come up with sort of what are the specific ideas you, you each sort of almost had them and I, I just want to make sure that we're sort of leaving the stage by going yes this is the thing that we could do because someone's going to get a call from the secretary or from the governor in the next couple of months that's going to say we're not at the seven and so how do we get to the seven so if we've got the three then do you see the other four coming from places like the idea that dale had now this water thing that you just described sounds totally awesome and relatively easy to do can we do that? The buildings seem to be this other place where we have a lot of buildings in the state that are cooled to 72 degrees. If we cooled them to 78 degrees, would that give us the gigawatts that we need to get to seven? So I'm reluctant to move on to the next question until I know that you feel comfortable saying, yes, with these ideas and you know a massive deployment of more solar and storage, we'll be able to get to seven and you can take that call and be able to assuredly say we're going to be at at least seven because you know the gap from seven to ten might come up if we have another and it seems very likely extreme heat storm so do you feel comfortable that we're going to be able to get there with the ideas that we've said here so i think um uh, one thing that i wanted to just kind of make sure that we tease it out a little bit more right which is for example this year we obviously got through a 7,000 megawatt departure from an average load on September 6th. So what did we do that day that worked out, right? We coordinated with our neighbors on imports. So that's something that we really need to think through. And that, you know, I, I you know, just thank Kaiso's work on, you know, figuring out how best to coordinate that, but also DWR and CPUC. It's like imports, right? How do we, you know, we got a lot of imports and that helped us through um, those, those six or seven days. So the second thing is, and this is where we need to think about both sides of the coin and reasonable trade-offs, right? So as um, Dale mentioned, a part of the equation is definitely dropping load in buildings and such. Problem with that, while it can happen, is the visibility 
and whether that will happen or not, right? Especially if it's not market integrated. And how do you make sure that's, that's visible? The second part of the demand side that we've done is, you know, the sobering part of the story, which is we've turned on every backup generator we had available in the state, right? We paid them to be turned on. And those are diesel um, backup generators, oftentimes in disadvantaged communities, right? So the sobering truth there is we can get through that. We have this huge opportunity to reduce the demand, but we have to depend on bugs, right? So then, you know, how do we talk about that trade-off and make sure that is the communities ultimately are made whole when we are relying on this for during this transition? Right. So between those two things, between those three things, you know, we massively got through the day. But also the other elements that we've done is the extraordinary things that the governor has done in terms of putting out an emergency proclamation, which allowed again for us to run our natural the thermal power plant fleet beyond permit levels. So ultimately, how we got through it is a lot of demand response, which we haven't completely quantified yet. We're figuring out where it is, where it came from. Part of it is bugs, we know that, and, and we definitely don't want to rely on them in the long run, but we might have to, and we have to figure out how best to have that trade-offs conversation, and, and also these imports and additional resources that we can rely on in a better planned way. So I think, I feel, given that we've gone through a 7,000 event, obviously 2,000 of that came through an extraordinary alert, but there is a lot of potential for us to expand our opportunities. And I feel comfortable not all the way to the 5,000 that you're talking about, but majority of it. And, you know, given that the next year we don't see any retirements yet, planned retirements, we have everything that we had this summer going to be there, and we are going to add more to the grid in terms of storage. So if the same event were to occur next year, it would not be as bad, right? But again, it would be much, much worse situation next year, so we have to think it through. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Vaishra, you, you touched on a really important thing, which I hadn't mentioned up till now, which is our neighbors. Uh, we did get over 8,000 megawatts of imports during September 6th. That's an impressive amount. Um, but it is it a given, it is a give and take. We are an import dependent uh, state and we are trying to work very closely with our neighbors in a more integrated market to make sure that we can have that dialogue with them to share resources and there were times when they fell into an emergency and we provided energy to them but also they provided energy to us so that is a very very powerful relationship also even within the state as i mentioned kaiso we're only 80 percent of the state so we have strong relationships with la strong relationships with smud bank uh, within the state but also outside of the state so that's a very powerful tool but we also have to recognize that as climate change comes it doesn't just come for us it could be west wide and we we saw that this past summer and also in 2020 i think we were lucky that in 2022 this past summer it was not as aggressively west wide as it was in 2020 and we didn't have the like number and intensity of fires at the same time that we experienced in in 2020 but having said that, that's that's one tool that we continue to foster those relationships. We make sure we have that regional market so that there is better use of resources everywhere, that, that we're not limited to the tools only within our toolbox, but with our neighbors and share that as well. But on the other two points that I've mentioned, yes, we do have a playbook. Uh, that we've shared with the governor's office and we share with others in order to, you know, work with folks like Dale and other uh, users in order to coordinate that um, shifting of load. So that's already in play and then we can improve upon that. So that will um, give us additional capacity um, as well as the, the generation development side. Um, SP 1020 is already out there. So that's already a green light for the KISO to be able to move forward to do that. So that's another really powerful tool. I think we're going to be able to unlock quite a few uh, megawatts of generation from there. Um, I think some of the solutions that we're looking for are the ones we talked about in uh, demand response and the like. But one thing I, I failed to mention earlier is having certainty of what the, the, the baseline is. When I was when we were reducing load during the 110 degree days, 
we said, okay, well, how much did we reduce it? Well, the week prior, we were consuming X amount of energy in this week, but the, but the previous week wasn't 110 degrees. We don't, we don't have a lot of baseline 110 degree days. People use more water uh, when it's hot out and our gardens are precious. You know, we're, we try to minimize the amount of water uh, outside, but in the summertime, that's where a lot of water is used, um, at least half in most of California. Um, so, um, uh, a, a big push from us would be more drought resistant plants and the like that would help a bit um but but also knowing agreeing on a baseline just saying we're reducing load it gets back to the end the certainty is like how how much are we going to reduce load i don't know i just know i'm gonna, I'm gonna not pump less in that window of time what i would have been pumping is really hard to to determine so agreeing like we said let's negotiate that prior to uh those events i think it's important to point out when we do talk about the next year or so and where our powers comes from and delphi mentioned we do um import at times uh, there's not a lot of hydropower this year. There's not a lot of water left in the reservoirs moving into the winter. And we have meteorologists from Scripps was up here earlier. He probably is not going to be able to give a motivational speech on what this winter is going to look like. But uh, it's not looking good. Uh, but hard to tell. Could get a few miracle atmospheric rivers here and there. But that's another thing we're going to have to contend with is when we're planning ahead, figure out what resources are going to be available. I know hydropower is not a big chunk of the power, but it is for us. It's what we rely on ultimately. So uh, that's another thing we need to be uh, thinking about. Well, thanks. We're at the time of the program where we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, but before we do that, I want to say that, that there is one interesting sort of long-term uh, project that came to light again today which is that um, the federal government has announced that they are going to sell some leases for offshore wind on december 6 off the coast of california now this is one of the things that i was saying you know this will be great in 2029 or 2030 you know it isn't going to help us or help you in the next year to get this but it is one of these longer term solutions that really needs all of your help to be able to work we need you to sort of be able to forecast it we need you to be able to build the transmission so it gets there and we need you to be able to use that electricity and sort of do it so help is on the way it's going to take a while to get here but but you know let's not stave that off but let's go to q and a i'm going to look over to my right and see if there's some questions first from zoom and then we'll take them from here in the audience yes thank you dan so our first one is from samantha pate and it's for vice chair gunda how does the CEC plan on changing the integrated energy policy report to project electricity consumption and demand that achieves California's decarbonization goals? Yeah, and thank you, uh, Samantha, if I heard the name right, uh, for the question. Yeah, so the demand forecast uh, has been continuing to evolve. Um, so the um, when we talk about demand forecast, it's not a single forecast that the CEC produces. Um, it's a it's a set of forecasts. We do a forecast under what we call an average condition of weather, but we also have under extreme conditions. So those forecasts already are available, um, but it, it has to be a collective statewide agreement on which forecast we might want to use for our planning purposes. So that's one. Two, we have uh, you know heard loud and clear from our partners, uh, both Kaiso and CPUC, on the need for hourly forecasts and also not just thinking about a forecast which we define as reasonable to occur versus also capturing some of the policy goals of the state for example high electrification so cec cpuc and kaiso collectively develop um, recommendations on how to evolve that so we have uh, you know we are continuing to evolve it into what we are now calling demand scenarios that could also be used um, to understand the electric load under policy considerations and how do we then use that for the irp purposes or the broader statewide planning purposes so that's kind of how it's being evolved in the iper this year uh, we are we are going to start uh, adopting some of them as a package we are calling them the california uh, planning library or the energy 
planning library. So love to hear from you if you have additional thoughts, but we are right now moving from a single forecast to a set of forecasts and scenarios that could be widely used by um, the state agencies for planning. Wonderful. So now we have a question from the in-person audience from Ryan Bixman with the California Council on Science and Technology. What are the tools or resources needed to plan ahead for a heat wave? What needs to be improved to plan ahead better? Great, I'll take the first crack on this. Um, thank you for the question. So as Vice Chair Gunda mentioned, demand forecast is absolutely critical, it is the foundation for everything that we do. And in fact, we take the um, demand scenario that Vice Chair Gunda had just mentioned, and it's the same one that the CAISO uses, that the CP uses, and also we're uh, coordinating with uh, Air Resources Board as well, so that we are all on the same page. And that really creates the foundation of what we expect to plan two so again the the generation um the transmission all of that is planned to uh that specific forecast we also do production cost modeling that looks at you know kind of the reliability based modeling of you know what is the probability of potentially having to lose load um and we go through that kind of scenario analysis to kind of figure out where our vulnerabilities and our sensitivities are and what we're finding in the last couple of years that when we've done these assessments it's almost always at sunset and again, so solar, really, really critical part of our fleet, um, but we do need more resources that are able to kind of bridge us between that solar and that evening peak, which seems to grow and grow. And also we depend on a lot of uh, rich information from the California Energy Commission to inform us about climate change impacts and where that is impacting. So for example, the coastal regions are heating up more so, and you know what does that do to demand, to electrification, et cetera. So I would say certainly the, the genesis of it and the foundation of it is going to be the demand forecast and then kaiso can then layer on top of that the generation side that's coming from the load serving entities and we can build out the transmission we've recently done an exercise called our 20-year conceptual plan including offshore wind for example um and then looking at you know what are some real game changers in the future for electrification etc so that hopefully that information out there helps the state think through the impacts of sb 100 and the goals it wants to reach to kind of move that plan forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Sarah Wolf. She's joining us via Zoom. What are the panelists' thoughts about microgrids or decentralized community grids? Do they have a positive impact or should communities focus on energy efficiency? Um, well, for us, we do have uh, well, a microgrid within a microgrid, you could say, at, because at every one of our water and wastewater treatment plants, we have a standby power, but it's diesel. And so, uh, but you can probably mute this part of the presentation. Diesel is very reliable, especially in an emergency, where, as I mentioned earlier, our main goal is to deliver water or to uh, process sewage and, and not violate any laws. So uh, we're, if the grid is out, that's our best bet. But, and in looking at, we, we've explored uh, microgrids at those facilities, but we just don't have the surface area for, um, for solar and batteries. Uh, it's usually a pretty dense load when we're delivering water, you know, we have, three to four megawatts in less than an acre, you, that, 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 the math just isn't there based on current technologies. Maybe in the future we can get there. Um, but as far as uh, microgrids and the like in the community, um, I, I guess I, I'm not really the expert on that. I'd let you guys talk about that. Um, just want to add, uh, I think just a specific response to Sarah, to you. I think microgrids have an extremely important role to play. When we talk about especially the SB100 transition, which is the long-term uh, zero carbon goals, there are two elements, right? So the resource build that we need to build, which uh, Dan alluded to, which is a sustained record build rates is happening because in that analysis, we haven't really considered how much we can do on the demand side, right? So it's important uh, for that reason to optimize uh, the ability to build um, as a whole, you know, both on the distribution side as well as the supply side. The second, specific constrained areas in California has an opportunity to rely on the distribution side better than, you know, without the transmission. So that's the second opportunity. 
And the third, it provides resiliency benefits, especially for communities that, that do not have a central resiliency hub. So I think overall, microgrids has a very important role to play. Um, the, the budget that was granted to the CEC uh, does take that into account and then provides a path to uh, improve our distribution side scale. Let me just say before we take the next question, it'll probably be the last one, is that, you know, we've talked a little bit here in this whole conference about extreme heat, but then also about the impacts that the diesel generators have or that the fossil fuel power plants have. And I think for too many people in California, they're getting the double negative impact of that. So they're seeing both the extreme heat and the air quality issues. And we know, and the panelists that were up here before, and, and it's sort of been documented again and again, know that that is a not only a quality of life issue, but a life issue that we have to be able to figure out and overcome and that we can't just sort of say, well, you know, we're going to sort of do this in the sake of that. Many people in California are suffering from the worst impacts of both of these issues. And I think what's incumbent upon us is not only to figure out how to get to the reliability that we need on this, but to do it in a way that's providing more safety into the community, whether that's through microgrids or whether that's through increased transmission or some of the ideas that Dale had. It's about creating sort of a plus plus as opposed to a plus negative or a negative negative. So maybe we've got time for one more question. Hopefully it's a quick one. And Yes, our next question is from Dr. Dr. Michael Schmelz from CSU East Bay. He's joining us in person today. So similar to the push to remove gas cars from roads to improve GHG emissions, how will the push towards electrification of many parts of our society impact grid operations, particularly when it comes to shocks like extreme heat? Yeah, um, great question. And I think uh, this is a very important discussion that um, California as a whole should have uh, both on the benefits of electrification and the importance of ensuring that we manage electrification properly. So uh, just kind of taking one of the two threads, which is the transportation, um, as Delphine mentioned earlier, the current grid issues or constraints come right at sunset, right, between that you know, we broadly say it's 4 to 9 p.m., but it's really between 6 to 8 p.m. is, is where we, we get the most constraint when the solar goes down and then we still have the air conditioning load. So if you look at how much the current electric vehicles are adding the load for that time right now today, it's approximately half a percent, right? Half a percent of our load is coming from that. Um, but as you go forward, and if it's unmanaged, then you could see anywhere from four, five, six percent by the end of the decade, right? So depending on what scenario you take. So that's where it's important to note the word managed is that how do you send the price signals? How do you make sure you're not uh, like inconveniencing the customer to charge at other times, but really uh, push the charging into times that you know do not come at, that, at those um, six to eight period time. So if you can do that, then one, it would won't add a lot of load to the grid. So it's about managing it. Two, with vehicles, you also have the ability to incentivize to potentially island the building and the vehicle to grid. So today we have about 10 gigs, 10 gigs of storage on vehicles today, just on the million vehicles we have in California. So if you're if you're moving forward, it's in a multiple tens of gigawatts of storage that we'll have on vehicles. And how do you monetize in a way that it's not inconvenient to a large customer base to make sure it supports the grid? Just as a stat, 95% of the time, uh, an average vehicle is stationary. So how do you monetize that? Well, that was really exciting. I want to first of all thank our panel here. They did a great job. So a round of applause for them, please. And then believe me, as exciting as you thought that was, the next panel coming up, just the name of it, Sounding the Alarm, has got to be exciting. And so uh, I want to call up Yumi Sirai, who's going to be the moderator here. Um, and this is going to be really exciting. So um, just quick, go do something, but get back in your seats ASAP. And thanks again, and we'll see everybody soon.
power sure. sticker. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Ready? Are these one sided? Are these one sided? You want to click this for last game? Is that helpful? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was going to circle back on a few points too. Uh, from earlier. If folks could take their seats, the next panel will be beginning shortly. Okay. Okay. Okay, because I know he brought his packages and stuff. Yeah. He seems like he's going to have a lot to say. I'm going to click it there so she doesn't forget. That's why. Do you, you know your name? Don't you? <laughs> no, I just don't. I don't sit on it. Do you want to hide your wallet? Okay, here's my other weekend. Yes, I do. If everyone can take their seats, we'll be beginning the next panel. Good morning. Good morning to all of you folks online as well. I think the camera's up there. Hope you're all sticking with us. My name is Yumi Sarah. I'm the new uh, executive director for the new Office of Community Partnerships and Strategic Communications. Really pleased to be here with um, and just learning so much just from this morning session. And I've got two great speakers with me. I will be moderating and asking the questions. But just before we started on that, I just wanted to sort of frame what we were, what we, what we'll be talking about. And actually, Dale, not to call you out from the Sonoma Water um, Department, or um, you just sort of sparked in me something by the way you were describing your work and how you were talking. And this is about in way long in the environmental days, you know, we talked about our ecosystem. And there's a lot of information coming out of these um, great panels today. And a lot, and it sometimes gets overwhelming. So sometimes I think about this great ecosystem of, of ideas and people and departments all trying to make a difference for our state. So, 
thank you to you for sparking that kind of like um, sort of image in my head as well. And today in our panel, we're going to be talking about a different ecosystem. And this is around um, our community partners, our trusted messengers in our community. And these are the folks who are on the ground. Just even this morning, I was talking to one of our community partners in Ventura, and she said, you're working on heat? You're talking about heat? We need to help you with that because in Ventura, one of our farm workers died this summer. And that sort of brought the numbers that we heard this morning to real life or to, to a death that actually happened, right? And she said it was one death, maybe two deaths, but that's just, you know, somebody's life that really mattered. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to try to bring community into the room and then to tie it and bridge it also to some of the work that uh, uh, we'll hear later on from community-based organizations, also called CBOs. Um, one of our partners also will be on that <laughs> panel this afternoon, Rachel Rios, who, who's, who's worked with us for, for um, quite a number of years. Um, but um, just wanted to introduce our two great public service leaders. I like to call you public service leaders and recognize um, some of um, the people behind the scenes and sometimes in front of in front as well. But our public service leader, Dr. John Fast, who is the Chief Community and Environmental Epidemiology Research Branch at the California Office of Environmental Health and Hazard Assess Assessment. And he'll be talking a little bit about um, somebody earlier this morning also said about turning some of our information and data into usable for our community. So he'll be talking a little bit about that. And Brian Ferguson, who's the Deputy Director of Crisis Communication and Public Affairs at the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. And Brian will be talking about um, how we can turn some of the information that we have as well and some of the, the, the work that um, the Office of Emergency Services has been doing to get out the messages and the information to the ground. And um, as I think for those of you uh, who may be online, um, we'll be, you'll be able to submit your questions and at the end of the session, uh, we'll be taking your questions as well. Um, I think also I just wanted to mention that two, two, two things that also stuck in my head from this morning's presentation from Dr. Basu. She said, we need to take our big picture results and look and focus at the community level and focus on our high risk populations. And then Secretary Crawford ended this morning's session by saying, we have to stay connected to the people on the ground. And so this session will help to start to explore some of some of um, some of how we're able to connect with community who we're also calling those trusted messengers. So maybe I'll turn it over to Brian first. Uh, if you could say a few words about how your work is is um, reaching some of our communities who are most at risk. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for having us. This is a, a critical and important topic, and thanks to Secretary Crowfoot and Director Asefa for, for hosting this. And, um, you know, at the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, for those of you who haven't worked with us, what we do is we coordinate across state government uh, around disasters to make sure we're applying a whole of government approach to help keep people safe. And one of the things we know and have experienced in recent years is that the most socially vulnerable in our communities are disproportionately impacted by disasters, whether that's COVID-19, a wildfire, or even a heat wave. And so the work that we do here and that we're talking about today on extreme heat is absolutely critical because it's 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 how we approach things. How do we ultimately keep people safe and save lives by understanding the individualized needs of our communities? Um, you know, this has started been a priority of this administration. The governor spent his first full day in office talking about wildfires and keeping communities safe because we've learned things. We've learned from the campfire 
um, that the people who perish in that, unfortunately, were disproportionately older Californians who couldn't get out of their homes. We know from our experiences with COVID-19, the people who passed away with that were disproportionately from particular communities where they didn't have many of the interventions in place uh, that we have that perhaps kept others safe. And so as we look at extreme heat, one of the things we want to do is how do we get the communications and the message deeply ingrained in the communities, but also understand that we as government are not always the best service or place to, for that information to come to. So how do we harness the power of those in the communities who perhaps are more trusted, who are the service leaders? Um, and that's really something that we've leaned in on during this administration to be more thoughtful about that um, with ultimately an idea that our climate is rapidly changing around us. We live in a more dangerous world than we did even a couple years ago. And that there's multiple complex overlapping challenges that can happen at the same time. The same issues that lead to a wildfire are the same issues that lead to a heat wave, that lead to an energy shortage. And so all these things are intertwined and how do we approach them in a manner that understands the considerations and ultimately helps keep people safe. Can you just give us an example of, of one of your programs? Sure. So, you know, one of the things we've done under the leadership of this governor is really invest in how we reach out to the communities. We have a program called Listos California, which is is ready in Spanish, which is something that started a program that was originated in Santa Barbara. We've taken that concept and and really blown it up to be statewide where we have 93 community based organization partners who we work in communities they've identified the pop a pop population or service group whether it's immigrants and refugees older Californians Californians experiencing homelessness and really tried to do culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach to reach them and that's something that we can do with heat waves as well as wildfires or earthquakes and so having that embedded equity that embedded uh, dimension of outreach is something that's really, really important and something that we continue to build on. And the new office that you're leading is going to be uh, critical to that work, too. So we're so happy to, to, to have you there leading it as well, because we understand that ultimately um, that's how we're going to keep Californians in a, in a better place and evolve to the changing challenges of our climate um, and the extreme heat poses to California. Brian, thank you, Brian. Dr. Faust, would you, John, would you like to talk to us a little bit about how data plays into the equity equation and, and the work that you're, you're, you're embarking on? Sure, thank you. And uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to participate. Um, uh, so I thought I'd start a little bit by just saying a little bit about what our office does. I'm with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or we call it WEHA, uh, which is one of the departments, the smallest department within the California EPA. Uh, a lot of what we do relates to uh, uh, looking at the relationships between exposures to harmful substances and, and health outcomes. Uh, and that information is used in a lot of different ways to set health protective levels for uh, standards in air, drinking water, cleanup levels for uh, toxic waste sites and so forth. Um, but uh, a lot of our work also has a uh, strong environmental justice or equity thread through it. Uh, for example, we develop and update the Cal Screen tool which is a tool intended to uh, capture the cumulative burden, you know, lots of uh, different sources of impact and different types of vulnerability and bring that information together uh, in a way that's useful and understandable to, to a broad audience. Uh, it looks at contaminants in water and air and in soil and uh, as well as health outcomes and, and vulnerabilities uh, from socioeconomic factors as well. Um, so, um, so we sort of bring that bring that through a lot of our a lot of our work um so a lot of what I mentioned already is relates to chemical stressors uh but we also have a, a, a good amount of climate work that goes on in our office uh so we heard we heard this morning from Dr Basu and that panel that sort of laid out uh, a lot of the health concerns and uh, her office and her group has been doing uh, you know, epidemiological work for nearly 20 years that has uh, really 
laid a, a strong foundation for understanding, you know, the health outcomes associated with heat uh, and exposure. So just some of the things that I would reinforce from, from that panel are that, you know, it's not just extreme heat, uh, it's temperature more broadly that uh, really is of, of concern uh, that the effects are broad. It's not just heat stroke, but, you know, we heard about, uh, you know, mental health outcomes, effects on uh, cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, you know, different types of uh, mental health outcomes and so forth. So uh, we need to th be thinking about that as we bring forward, you know, our work on understanding extreme heat and heat more broadly. Uh, and then finally, there's the, the vulnerable population. So, uh, you know, we, we talked about, uh, you know, the uh, outdoor workers, the elderly, uh, children, and so forth. Uh, and then this, this other sort of more subtle idea that people in different parts of the state may be differentially vulnerable uh, because of what they're acclimatized to. So I think all of that uh, is important work. Um, and just one other one other piece of work that I thought I'd mention is that we periodic periodically uh, produce a report on the indicators of climate change in California. Uh, and this this work looks at uh, you know collections of information that tell us things about how the drivers of climate change are are, are changing, uh, you know how climate itself is changing, temperature and so forth, uh, and what those effects are on both biological and physical systems across the state, you know, how wild wildfires are uh, changing, how nighttime temperatures are rising, uh, and so forth. And, you know, we all we all talked a lot about uh, some of this already. Uh, so some of what I want to talk about is sort of this uh, work going forward that our office expects to be engaged in, and that's in the implementation of uh, AB 2238, which is the extreme heat ranking bill. Um, so that bill charges the California EPA with uh, developing a heat ranking system over the next couple of years by January of 2025. Uh, and basically, the the idea is to to think about that in terms of uh, you know how how we look at these these heat events and their impacts. Uh, and to think about how we can make that information available by using the best available data. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the parallels that we talked about were the, uh, uh, you know, the hurricane ranking systems where there's a gradation that we all know about and naming uh, of hurricanes and red flag uh, warnings for wildfire that are based on temperature and wind conditions and so forth. Um, uh, but this gives us a very specific charge, you know, to Cal EPA in thinking about a heat ranking system, uh, which would include, you know, uh, not just temperature and, uh, you know, the the variables of uh, the physical environment, but also to be thinking about what we know about that relationship between uh, heat and health outcomes, what past heat uh, events tell us about impacts. Uh, as well as certain other factors that can uh, affect uh, heat, like urban heat island effect and, uh, you know, the protective effects of, of tree canopy, for example. Um, and, it, and the ask with this bill is that we do this through a public, public process. Uh, so uh, we're, you know, beginning to uh, think about what that could look like, you know, how we interact with our partners, how we interact with public and community organizations that have relevant information uh, about how we how we might move that forward. Uh, but it really is uh, something of a, a bringing together of information uh, that we hope will be useful for, um, you know, informing uh, strategies to reduce uh, impacts from heat. Uh, just a, you know, a few things about uh, the heat ranking system generally. Uh, and these these are themes that I think have have come up already. Uh, you know, one we need to think about scale. Uh, you know, we talked about some of the granularity of data, and you know what we can do. We know we know these impacts are likely to be uh, somewhat localized. We talked about differences in zip code, uh, but we also know there's challenges around that with what what we have information available and how quickly we can get it. Uh, and the second item I would mention is timeliness. We need this information to be available so that so that people can take uh, take actions. We know there's likely to be lots of different 
you know, partners in this pro process uh, and that they're, they're, we're going to be needing different mechanisms and different tools uh, to bring this information forward. And just the third thing I would, I would say, we also need to be thinking about how we communicate this information, what that looks like, uh, how we put it in a form that's going to be useful for people. So I'll, I'll leave it with that for now. And uh, can I just pile, I'm gonna pile on there just for a second, because I think one of the things that's really important is not just harnessing the science and the knowledge and like all of this stuff we have in California right now. But one of the things we talked about that I think is really important is this only works if we can get it to people, right? We can have the best science, we can have the best knowledge in the world, but thinking through, and that's one of the things that this group is doing, that we'd look to the public for, for input in the process as it's created of how do we get this information in the hands of those who need it? Our, our news environment, even just in the last two years, has changed so dramatically where we have a shrinking press core. We have, um, you know, more uh, changes in terms of like how people view news and who's trusted and who isn't even as in where people receive their news from and there also is a greater expectation because of the way technology works now for a timeliness and an immediacy where people can order a sandwich and have it delivered to this room and have it be seen every step of the way from when you order it to when it arrives at that door but maybe we give them the news about the wildfire the weather one time a day and so like how do we get that into people's hands so they can take these life-saving protective actions, whether it be, you know, drinking more water that day, not sending people out in, to do dangerous jobs. And that's one of the things that, that we're talking about, that our offices will talk about of like, how do we get that information to those who need it? And how do we do it in a way that um, matches the needs of consumers in the current news environment, the expectation the public has, um, not just the general public, but our, our very customized audiences or niche in California, either because English is not their first language or there's community barriers or there's any of these other sort of barriers to entry. And that's where having these sort of community partners is so vital and so important. Thank you. <laughs> this is really exciting actually for me to meet these two um, really great public service leaders just because I'll hopefully get a chance to work with them in the near future. Um, having worked at the census, we know how important data is and really looking at the data to, and to use that for decision making as we also did for our COVID-19 vaccinate all 58 campaign. And so thank you for doing that and setting it up in such a way that is usable. And it's just really, um, the combination of, of having data to inform our decisions and, and, and also the analysis of that data. You can throw all sorts of numbers at me, but if you don't tell me what that means, I don't know what to do with it, right? And then to have the information aspect of it to make sure that it's accessible and it's timely, it's in language, and really um, gets to the core of the people who matter. So one of the ways that we looked at starting from the census, so I worked also with um, Census 2020 and also with the Vaccinate All 58 campaign. One of the ways that we looked at um, how we made these decisions and, and what we did with it basically was to sort of very simply um, put it in three, three sort of buckets. One is looking at where, as you said, we need to know where at a very localized level, the census tract or a zip code, where these people are, are, are and who these people are, and really looking at some of the barriers to access. Do they live in a multi-unit housing that's all, you know, it's behind gates? How do we get to them? Do they go to church? Do they, are they, um, which language do we speak? And even talking to my friend in Ventura this morning, she was talking, we started with like eight languages. California and the beauty of its diversity, she says, we're now up to 16 languages. And many of these languages are what we call minority languages and are not written. So how do you get to these people? And then the third point, so we've got the where, the who these folks are, and then and the demographics of who these folks are um and then how so how is really the strategies and the tactics of working through our community partners 
through our trusted messengers. They might be the faith-based organizations. They might be um, the temple or the mosque or the church and these leaders, or they might be your school sites. So how is it that we can do this? And it's really our community and trusted messengers who know where, how, who, how, where um, these folks are. And so that's that's um, where um, what we hope to do also with the HEAT campaign. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of the programs that you might have that really reach out to these communities, how you might be translating information into the, you know, into whatever they speak, not necessarily language or whatever, but, and to get to where they are. Yeah, I think, you know, that, that's such an important question for what we're talking about now, because like, I have all all the faith in what OEHA is doing, what our scientists, we have the best scientists in the world in California. And I'm very confident that we're going to have a data and modeling system that's like second to none will probably be one of the first places in the world this has been done. But the thing that keeps me up at night that we're thinking about is, is the where and the how, right? Like, how do we deliver it to folks? How do we get it in a timely way? And what, what are the vehicles which to do it? You know, it, gone are the days of just buying TV ads in Los Angeles and thinking that that's an effective way, way to reach people. Most people don't watch like over the top TV anymore or even read the newspaper. Everyone gets their their information directly on their phone. Right. So it's like and then we also the way COVID has changed the world in terms of like even knocking on doors is different than it was a couple of years ago. People are less likely to open their door for someone to come and talk to them. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as government to kind of evolve the way that we do things. And I think we saw part of that in in the recent heat wave and Vice Chair Gunda and our, our colleagues from the um, independent system operator up here talking about that. You know, we've been for years, California has been blasting ads on the radio and on TV, asking people to flex their power, to flex, do a flex alert. And so when we're on a multi-day heat wave and nothing else is working, we had to use the break glass option of doing the wireless emergency alert. This is not something we take lightly, lightly or without thoughtful consideration. It's a tool that usually you use that says the fire's coming towards your town or that there's a missing person. And you can't do that very often because it has a uh, because it will lose the value and the the importance if we're doing it for everything. But, you know, I think what that showed us is if you put the right information in front of the right people at the right time, and we put it directly in 27 million Californians' hands, and within 10 minutes of that, we saw megawatts coming off the grid in a manner that kept our grid reliable and probably did save lives, but particularly for those who uh, use durable medical equipment or, you know, have any sort of other condition where losing power during that heat wave is, is, is a crisis for them. And so kind of looking at that in terms of how do we harness that with heat to get the information or what is the version of that that helps drive people to action? Because Californians are an amazing and adaptive group of people. People who come here are here because they, they you know, them or their ancestors like have, have that spirit. And we know that if we can get that information to people's hands, they will take action. And so that's the thing we're thinking through, what our collective offices will think through of how do we drive the action in an effective way that, you know, it can be repeatable as we experience these extreme heats and these threats to our vulnerable Californians. So John, for you, as we present our, our, our issues of how we reach people, how can we use data and the systems that, that you will be developing, but also thinking through some of the systems you've developed in virus green, uh, human rights to water, those kinds of tools how can we use that and then sort of connect it with our qualitative data from our community partners to to make the best decisions on the ground well i i think you know with tools like calendar virus screen and you know sort of our related you know human right to water work where we're looking uh, you know across you know bringing together a lot of different information i think we've we've benefited enormously from having a very robust public engagement process in in moving moving those forward. Um, you know, with you know repeated uh, you know rounds of of comment. Uh, you know, providing 
craft tools that let people experience things and figure out how they get information. Um, but I, it, I think in this case, we're probably even going to be needing to think beyond that, uh, you know, because there are there are going to be people who aren't getting their information that are vulnerable, you know, from the Internet or, you know, necessarily through their their phones. And um, I think I think that's where building the partnerships and thinking about relationships and thinking about you know how to how to sort of distill information uh to useful formats uh very rapidly is is going to be helpful uh where you know we we have basically a network that that enables information to to spread where it's needed relatively quickly um so that's um We've, We've got, got it looks, looks like, like I just, just got, got the 10 minute, minute sign. I think that is sign for me to get some Q and A's questions. Yes, wonderful. So our first question is from Michelle Sevilla. She's joining us via Zoom. Her question is, I've had conversations with constituents who do not have access to rapid technology or means of communication. What best practices are there for people who do not have computers, smartphones, tablets, et cetera? Right. That's a, that's, that's a great, a great question. question. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. Michelle. And it's not, not just people who don't, who might not have the devices, but who might not also have internet access. And so do you have any tips on that, either of you? Yeah, just, this is something we think about all the time, especially the context of, of wildfires. And I think a lot of it may be duplicative that we could, there's things we could pick up and use of many of the places that are most at risk. There's often low broadband subscription or under, under subscription in terms of people's ability to access the internet, which I think, you know, relies even more, makes it even more important that there's community face to face people that a text message is not the be all end all. We sometimes become over reliant on technology um, during during disasters and think that, you know, we even have challenges where people can't drive out of their own neighborhoods without having their their wireless on on their phone to be able to get the map. But I think this is something there that sometimes it, it, it it's old school boots on the ground, people talking to each other, um, mailing printed flyers, and person to person from a trusted person, not not a person not from the community, but from from the pastor, from the local police chief, if that's appropriate, from a neighbor helping neighbor. And that's really the value of what we do here is like empower neighbors to help each other. We know from the social science of the research that if you tell Californians to do something to save themselves, they're somewhat likely to do it, but if you tell them to take a protective action to protect themselves and their family, they're infinitely more likely to do it, like by a 25% margin. And so that's something we know, and they have that, you know, sort of underlying appeal is that we can, when you help each other, um, it really brings along the whole community. John, anything else you want to? Uh, yeah, I, I don't, have, I don't have much more to add. I think that that you know addresses the. The question um yeah I, I was just thinking a little bit about sort of the media landscape and how that's changing and you know i think i think about other warning systems like for hurricanes and how much that benefits from you know broadcasting that information through through media you know outside of the internet um so yeah i think i think all of those are important and uh that's about it one of my favorite CBOs talks about eye to eye messaging. So, yeah. Next question. Thank you. Our next question is from Sarah Lana. She's also joining us via Zoom. This is a question for Dr. Faust. How might the heat ranking system interact or relate to um, the National Weather Service heat risk forecasting effort? Uh, well, I, I don't have an answer for that right now. Um, but uh, I, I do expect that, uh, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of reliance on similar similar data sets. Uh, I think we're going to be looking specifically at, you know, California populations in terms of thinking about how, how we, uh, you know, would set a threshold or, uh, you know, think about, uh, you know, how we define uh, the heat event that's going to be uh, of impact. Uh, so I think there's going to be sort of an overlaying of information. 
Thank you. And then our next question is from Olivia Seedman. She's in person with us today from the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Beyond awareness of extreme heat events, how is the state ensuring vulnerable communities, farm workers, immigrants, low income, communities of color, unhoused folks are aware of and can access resources to deal with extreme heat? So for example, what is the pipeline from awareness to access to resources? Yeah, thank, thank you for that. It, it, this is important. This is a question we ask ourselves every day. There's been significant investment in new new tools and programmatic efforts. Um, we probably have more programs than we've ever had as a state to try to support immigrants and refugees and other vulnerable groups. But those those programs only work if we can help people access them. And I think you know the, the the mere fact that we're sitting here with Yumi with, with with the office that they're doing is like the centerpiece and the backbone of that work of that we have prioritized community outreach and public engagement in a way that has not been done before in the history of California. That's not to say that we're done or that it's all there. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but this is like the fact we're having this form, we're having these conversations, we're going to lean forward and you know. My goal is that all of these smart smart folks who do the community outreach, who do the science, that they're able to help people access the tools in a culturally, linguistically appropriate manner that works for them so it doesn't become an emergency. So we don't need Cal OES, that we're actually just doing our backbone state program areas. Um, and that's different for each community. For farm workers, it's different than for individuals experiencing homelessness. And there's going to need to be different tools and outreach strategies for each of those groups. But, you know, I think that's what we're solving for. And we welcome the input of the advocate community and so many of you who are here and watching to help us because many of you are significantly more versed in these areas than we will be. And so bringing that input in to help craft programs that resonate, that work, and that ultimately during times of crisis are able to keep people safe. I think also what we learned from the census and the vaccination campaign too, and some of the mistakes that we made, but lessons learned really, was really to pause and just listen, listen to what the communities are telling us. And then, you know, see what others are, are saying and really um, make decisions based on not just the quantitative data, but the qualitative data of what we're hearing. I've been leading um, what we, we're calling community connections around the state to, to listen to smaller groups of people. We'll be, listen, we'll be going to San Diego um, this, this Thursday to listen to immigrant and refugee groups. So really just a circle of folks just to just to talk about who are you what 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 works for you um and how how do you interact with your own communities as well right so really um learning from um learning from what we what we already have done what we already know about our outreach tactics and what works and then to to really build on that cuz you know what what we did two years ago pre-COVID might not work, you know, next month, right? So really trying to pivot and and evolve as well in, in how we're doing our work. Thank you. And this touches on your responses to the last question, but we've received a few questions in the chat from folks joining us via Zoom um, regarding the same issue. So how do you work to communicate with communities that are unhoused? Yeah, I th thank you for thank you for that. This is, um, you know, we we've made a priority in some of our programs where we've identified target populations and um, immigrants and refugees, those with low broadband subscription, old Californians, uh, those experiencing homelessness, and I think each of them have unique strategies and tactics that are going to work for them. Um, we have a broad advocate and community-based organization outreach community. The people who who are working with the unhoused have the best ideas, but it you know because because they do it right. They have the relationships, and particularly with many of the challenges, having us showing up there, you know, me with a badge and in a in a state marked car, that's not going to work for some of our unhoused neighbors. But someone who they get 
you know, meals from every day. They interact with whether it's a faith-based group, a service organization, um, someone who's trusted, who walks the neighborhood every day. Um, those are the kind of people we're going to work with to build relationships so that we as a state can pass down tools, whether it's a flyer or a gift card or a, a something, or even just knowledge on here's where, here's where the cooling center is. Um, and so, you know, the where and the how, as we talked about, is something that we're looking really hard at to, um, you know, once we have the underlying data, we can focus, okay, John's team has identified, you know, Ventura County is where we're having a challenge. Let's, who, who is on the ground there? Who, who can support them? And what resources do we have that we can rapidly deploy to make these changes to help those communities? And, you know, this is something that's evolving right now. Like our, our, our outreach strategies that worked a couple of years ago are going to be different and, um, you know, more evolved. And that's, that's what we're doing, taking this feedback right now. And that's certainly something we view as a priority. I, I, that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to our panelists, John and Brian. Um, I'm really looking forward to personally working with both of you and, and, and seeing, um, this really rich discussion, I think, is always is is really going to lead to some really great partnerships, at least for our state agencies as well. And I do welcome any uh, more questions or comments or feedback from from both the audience here and and online um, as we as we go forward with our our um, mitigation and our 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 uh, work to alleviate the concerns for our communities in um, for the extreme heat. Thank you. Folks, we'll be taking a break for lunch until 1230 p.m. where we'll reconvene. For those joining us over Zoom, we'll continue to stream. So feel free to stay on the call if you'd like. Um, and we'll pick back up at 1230 with our keynote address by assembly member Luz Rivas. Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, a lot of thoughtful and informative conversation this morning. And uh, now I am very excited to introduce our keynote speaker, a person actually in California who does not need an introduction when it comes to uh, her work on climate equity issues um, um, in this state. She's also uh, an alumna, and she and I went to uh, MIT together, but different times. So I'm really excited about um, Assembly Member Luz Rivas uh, joining us to be the keynote uh, speaker this afternoon. A little bit about her background for those who don't know her, especially 
out of state. Um, Assembly member Luz Rivas was born in Los Angeles to an immigrant family and grew up in the northern and the northeast San Fernando Valley. She attended LA Unified Schools before earning a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from MIT and a master's of education from Harvard University. During her time in the legislature, she has authored successful legislation such as SB 54, the Plastic Pollution Prevention and um, Packaging Producer Responsibility Act. It's a mouthful, but a very impactful um, legislation. And also AB 2238 to establish the first in the nation advanced warning and ranking system for extreme heat waves and has helped secure $175 million uh, for extreme heat. Assembly member Luz remains uh, committed to adv advocating for environmental justice through her role as the chair of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources and as Assemblywoman representing Assembly District 39. Most importantly, selfishly for me, um, I work very closely and my office works very closely uh, with her and including her uh, setting up the integrated climate adaptation and resiliency program at uh, the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research, where I serve as the director. With that, I ask our keynote speaker, Assembly Member Rivas, to please uh, take the stage. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hey, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I like when people respond. It's great. Uh, you know, I'm Assemblywoman Luz Rivas. Excited to be here at this first ever California Extreme Heat Symposium. You know, an issue that I've been working on with a lot of you um, and a lot of people in Sacramento, across the state, and across the country. Um, this is a good time for us to all come together uh, to work on this issue. Uh, we, I know we have many experts today, and I was looking at the agenda and all of the, the panels. Um, and when I was looking at it, I was like, wow, this is integrating, this topic integrates, you know, urban planning, climate, uh, public health, uh, law, emergency management, right, all in one, and, and a lot of those representatives are, are part of these panels, or even new technologies, right, what, you know, the development, which I'm always very excited about um, as an engineer, right, thinking about technology and how we could use technology to help people is something I always think about, uh, but, you know, I, this issue, this ex extreme heat is very personal to me, uh, you know, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, and if you're not familiar with that area, it's one of the hottest areas in Los Angeles, probably in the whole county. Um, the valley has always been hot, right? Um, and now it's getting even hotter and unbearable, especially for families that don't have air conditioning, which is very common. So the my district is the Northeast San Fernando Valley, um, it's a uh, majority low income um, immigrant families in that in my part of the San Fernando Valley, and it's where I grew up. Um, and I remember as a child uh, in the summer when it was unbearable and at times that we didn't have AC um, and my mom's DIY methods of keeping us cool at home were not working right we were using water and fans all over the place in, in the home. Um, you know, we would have to just leave the home and go to the mall and just walk around, right? Or go to, let's go to Target or, you know, some, uh, the department store. And even if we're not buying anything, let's just walk around, right? <laughs> because we need to keep cool. Um, and so I think of families that don't have AC or uh, a lot, what happens a lot is they don't want to use it because of the expense, right? It's very expensive. Um, their energy bill and my mom still does that today she won't turn on the ac and luckily i have a nest uh, in her home and on even from here when i'm up here i'm looking she doesn't it's 108 degrees and she doesn't have the ac on right so i turn it on 
remotely uh, because I, you know, I, you know, I pay for my mom's, you know, um, utility bills. Um, and it's uh, like, I want her to be safe. You know, she's almost 80. Um, and the heat can exacerbate some of her health issues. Um, and I don't care how much it is, right? <laughs> I want her to be safe. But not everybody has that luxury, right? Where these costs are something that, that a family a household can't afford. They have to decide, we turn on the AC or we buy groceries for the week. Um, and so that's why I'm passionate about working on this issue with all of you here today. Uh, I have uh, authored legislation, um, one that got signed by the governor this year, AB 2238, which is creating the nation's uh, first ever um, heat ranking system and advanced warning. Um, and so a panel of experts will get together here in California um, and develop a way to communicate to the public and to better prepare local governments when we are experiencing these extreme heat weather events. Um, and I really believe that's going to make the difference because some of us, oh, we stay home, um, uh, we're not prepared for the heat. Uh, we still continue to do what we normally do um, and it's not healthy, right, for us. Uh, when I was working on legislation this year, uh, we engaged with medical professionals. We got a letter from emergency room physicians that said they notice when there is an extreme heat wave, they, they, you know, there's an increase in emergency room admissions uh, and the health issues are all exact because they're exacerbated by the heat. Right, so they get recorded as a stroke or you know some other um, diagnosis. Uh, but if you correlate that with the time that it happened, it's during the heat wave, right? And so, you know, we're engaging the medical community um, and others, and, and it, it's something that we need. I'm glad that we are working on, and it's necessary because. Climate change is not something that is happening in the future. It's already happening now. And the, these summers, these extreme heat waves are going to get worse. Um, and we need, as the state of California, we need to better prepare our communities and give and also provide resources to our cities and our counties. You know, I'm from Los Angeles and I know Los Angeles has that infrastructure and big research universities that are working on this. But at now I think of the Central Valley and other parts of the state that may not have that, that big infrastructure thinking about heat. Uh, and so we need, as a state, it is our responsibility to do something on extreme heat. Uh, you know, it, this affects communities of color more, right? Of vulnerable communities and populations uh, like our senior citizens um, and others. I, and, you know, we really need to continue to work on extreme heat. Um, we were successful this year on some legislation. Um, we've created um, grant programs that uh, the Office of Planning and Research um, will make sure that these grants are getting out there to our communities that most need it. Uh, and I know there's a lot more to do, and that's why you're all here and you're part of this community um, to join us. Uh, you know, we're on, I'm on the legislative side, but I know a lot of you are advocates and researchers and technologists, and uh, it takes, it's going to take all of us. Uh, and as a state, I know California will, is le already leading in this issue area. Uh, and we want to continue to, because I think of um, resilience and how important that is to our communities. Uh, so uh, just excited to be here. I'm thankful uh, that the administration is prioritizing extreme heat. Uh, my office has worked um, together with the administration. Uh, also, since I started working on this issue, several of my colleagues, um, both in the assembly and in the state senate, have joined me because they relate to it. Uh, they're from different parts of the state uh, that are affected by extreme heat. Um, and so it's great to recruit more people, right, to work on this issue in, in the legislature. Uh, so uh, excited to 
you know, continue to, to work on this. This is just the beginning. Um, we've been successful. And I want to make sure that, you know, we keep our foot on the pedal on this issue and not, okay, it's over and move on to a new issue area. Um, because this is going to be something that we all need to continue working on um, and make sure that our communities um, are protected. Uh, so our future generations, you know, are going to grow up fearing the summer. Um, and I, you know, even it was, even though it was very hot, I used to look forward to summer as a kid. Even today, summer is one of my favorite seasons. Um, but now it's becoming a season that is very dangerous for a lot of us, for a lot of families. And I think of our children and our future generations uh, because extreme heat affects all of us in our lives. Uh, and while we've been successful this year, there's a lot more, probably more policy and legislation. Uh, my colleagues and I are always open to new ideas on what direction the state should go in and how we could be helpful um, to all of you here today. Um, so please feel free to contact us. My office is always looking uh, to further this discussion and also, you know, hear new ideas on what we can be doing um, together in the state of California. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to speak today. And just thank you for all of you for being here. I know there's um, hundreds of you online that are not here in person. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, you know, to be here today, to listen to the amazing panelists uh, that are here to discuss this issue area. Um, and, you know, California is going to continue leading on this. I'm very proud of that. Uh, and so thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Our next agenda is the proximal center. Well, I think we may be receiving some feedback. Um, One moment, please. But if the panelists and moderators for our next agenda, Health equity at the heart of extreme heat action could come on stage. We'll get started as soon as we resolve the audio issue. Apologies. Our next panel will be nature based climate solutions. Is this on? It is. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you to the panelists here. Uh, we have an expert uh, panelist on a number of different issues related to nature-based solutions, specifically around green schoolyards. Uh, my name is Juan Altamirano. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Trust for Public Land, um, where you know the Trust for Public Land is an organization dedicated to not just protecting large, large landscapes across uh, California and, and the country, but also working in urban environments to ensure that there's equitable access to the outdoors, uh, providing uh, greening uh, in schoolyards. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here. A couple uh, housekeeping items. Um, I think, I think we, we have forgotten, forgotten already, already uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, participants in the audience, uh, fill out the cards and uh, raise them to the runner so they can grab them. And uh, if you want to ask a question in Zoom, uh, make sure that you type in the question into the Q&A menu. Um, so uh, with that, we'll, we'll get started. Um, I'll, what, what I'll do here is we're going to be talking about green schoolyards, green schoolyards and the importance of green schoolyards uh, across California and how to uh, make sure that kids in our environment um, 
ha have a, a reduced uh, heat exposure uh, across, across the state. So today we have Amanda. Um, she Amanda is a pediatrician in Richmond and uh, then chief uh, John Melvin and then uh, Tracy Quinn uh, with the uh, with Hilda Bay and I can't remember your name Sarah great so uh, what we'll do is have two two uh, minutes just asking what excites you about this topic what are the opportunities that we see here how can we reduce as a, a panelist in the previous uh a panelist said the suffering that we will continue to see potentially uh among our most youngest and vulnerable populations great hi everyone thanks uh for having me here. My name is Amanda Melsine. Um, as Juan said, I'm a primary care pediatrician. I practice in Richmond in the East Bay. Um, and I'm a co-founder of an organization called Climate Health Now. And also very relevantly, I'm also a mom to two elementary age California public school children. Um, so this topic is extremely near and dear to my heart in, in all ways. Um, I, you don't need me to repeat this, but uh, I will. Climate change is the greatest threat to child health that we face today. It is going to impact the health of every child alive today. Um, and we're already seeing the health impacts. As Assembly, Rivas, Assembly Member Rivas just said, I was finding myself nodding along so much. The, the heat wave that we experienced about a month ago, I can't tell you how many of my patients and families are still talking about that um, and talking about what it was like or dealing with ongoing asthma exacerbations related to that heat wave. So this is, you know, really happening all around us and especially to our children. Um, something that pediatricians are fond of saying that I think is very true is that kids are not just little adults right their bodies are are different than adult bodies um and they're also really at the whim of adults to take care of them right when it's really hot when the air quality is poor they need adults to move them indoors or out of harm's way so while this is a huge threat it is also a huge opportunity and one that i think is so exciting because, you know, figuring out ways to incorporate climate solutions into our schools will pay, you know, forward millions of times over. And kids, I can tell you myself as a mom to a first grader, kids are really excited about and hungry for this information. So I'm excited to, to hear what everyone has to say and what questions you all have, but I feel like the potential here is, is really limitless. I'm John Melvin. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director for Resource Protection and Improvement at CAL FIRE. And one of the programs that I oversee is the Urban and Community Forestry Program. And we'll be implementing uh, a large grant program for school greening. And uh, I've been in this business for a very long time, having worked in the program uh, my entire career, now overseeing it. And um, there's few things that I'm as passionate about as this. I concur. I also have school age children that go to public school. And uh, what I see around the state throughout my career are schools that aren't conducive learning environments. Um, when you have a 20 acre campus that's 80% blacktop, that's not conducive to learning. When it's warm outside, the kids go out to play, they come in hot, they can't learn. They're not, they're, they're, that's the last thing on their mind. And so we need to provide more functional, we need to use vegetation and other solutions to provide more functional learning environment for our students. Not only that, we have to protect their health. And increasingly with extreme heat, it's gonna take both short-term and long-term solutions. Using vegetation, using trees, uh, using green infrastructure um, is a longer-term solution. It has some short-term benefits, but we need to invest in that infrastructure now so that these kids benefit from it long term. It's for the next generation as much as the current. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Quinn. I am the CEO of Heal the Bay. 
Uh, our mission is to restore and protect the watersheds of Greater LA and the Santa Monica Bay. To do that, we use science and policy. Some of you may be familiar with our beach and river report cards, uh, where we distill really complicated water quality data into really easy to use public health um, report cards, so you know where it's safe to swim. Uh, we focus on education. We run an aquarium at the Santa Monica Pier, where every year we educate 10,000 kids, over 70% of them from Title I schools, where they learn about climate change, watersheds, and they get to pet baby sharks. Um, and we also do community engagement. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, pretty often are beach cleanups the third Saturday of every month. So if you're in LA, come join us uh, for a nothing but sand. And you know, the, through those beach cleanups is where we really started to see the problem of um, you know the trash at the beach. And if any of you have been lately or been after a storm, you will see that it's it's a huge problem. And 80% of that trash is not coming from people who have left it there. It's coming through our storm drain system. Um, it's flowing out through uh, flood channels and rivers. Um, you know, the, the same things that are causing extreme heat are, are causing huge pollutions to our rivers and our ocean. It's the fact that we have paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Um, never thought I'd be quoting John Mitchell, Joni Mitchell so much in my career, but, um, you know, that, that that's just, that's where we are. The, the, in the fact that we have, um, uh, changed from uh, permeable environments from the natural environment and made it so that you know water our flood protection of forcing that water straight into a storm channel um, over blacktop is, is is contributing to our extreme heat our solution to uh, the pollution problem is also a solution for extreme heat we started focusing on stormwater expanding stormwater capture throughout la um, so what is stormwater capture? It's simply diverting precipitation, mostly rain, uh, from drains. You can do that in your uh, the landscaping at your home. Um, we're doing a lot in front yards. Um, that means green streets. That means parks. That means large infiltration basins and schoolyards. Um, the benefits of stormwater capture are it improves the water quality. It reduces the pollution that's getting to our rivers and ocean increases water reliability because we can capture it for either reuse on site or or capture it and let it infiltrate into our groundwater basins and recharge the supplies of our communities um, it can help protect us against flood climate change also means that we're going to see really we're going to go long periods of hotter and drier and then all of that precipitation is going to come in a very short period of time so stormwater capture and greening schoolyards is going to also help to help us protect against fl uh, the floods that we're likely to see with climate change it allows us to have public green space, improve habitat, uh, reduce energy use, and again, combat extreme heat. Some of the major challenges for stormwater capture in general is um, it's historically difficult to fund because most infrastructure funding goes to traditional gray infrastructure, um, like treatment plants and pumping systems. I think the opportunities we see that there are new funding measures in LA County in 2018, we passed measure W that gives us about, I think $380 million a year for stormwater capture projects. Obviously there is the funding for the green schoolyards. Um, and I think, you know, another thing we're really excited about is just the potential. Uh, just in the Bay Area and SoCal alone, we have about 420,000 to 630,000 acre feet of water a year that we could be capturing that we're not, much of that goes out to the oceans. Um, and in schools, I mean, there's just in LAUSD, there's 6,400 acres of land. So that's just an incredible opportunities. And I think, you know, going back to what we see at, um, at Heal the Bay with education, there's also incredible educational opportunities for having stormwater capture and having green space on campuses. Um, and I'll just, I guess, close my opening remarks with uh, individual projects are great, but we need systematic change. So that's the goal, systematic change. Super cool. I just learned a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm Sarah Bernal. I am the new uh, program lead for urban agriculture for the California Department of Food and Ag. Um, so I've been working outdoors, operating small scale mixed vegetable operations myself for the last 12 years. and now, as the urban ag program lead for CDFA 2023 will be my first season where I'm no longer farming. 
So I'm grateful for the opportunity to be in this position and um, being included in this panel. So thank you for, for having me. Um, you know, if I look back at 2010, I can honestly say that summers were hot, but they were bearable. And then I think back really to starting in 2018, for me, at least as like what, what I remember as being kind of traumatic summer, September, September started bringing these, you know, 110 plus humidity, plus serious smoke um, layering on top of itself. And in order to complete a harvest, you know, I, I'd be out there wearing a half face rubber sealed particulate respirator, um, which means that every time you're doing a harvest and you're lifting a bin, there's just sweat spewing out of the filters. I mean, it's just rough times to be working outside uh, during these extreme heat waves. So uh, there are a lot of challenges that are faced in the agricultural sector from the realities of extreme heat and now smoke as well that occur every summer. For example, the trusted crop varieties that we've relied on are beginning to fail. Uh, stressed out crops are more susceptible to disease and pest pressures, which lead to more pesticide and more fungicide use. Decreased water supplies, which we actually were using as a means to help mitigate what plants need during extreme heat is becoming less and less available. Um, and the agricultural labor force, which is made up of hundreds of thousands of you know, low wage undocumented workers across the state are facing deadly conditions with increased frequency every year. But we all have to eat. So we likely also realize that access to healthy food is not equitable across our communities. Food deserts are a representation of discriminatory policies that have generated communities where access to healthy, nutrient-dense food don't exist. And so what can we do to shift this narrative? Um, I think that the fact that the state has taken the bold step to add an urban agriculture program lead position for CDFA is a huge show of force and commitment to empowering a local, more resilient food system. I was reading a whole bunch of studies, and if we are going to be doing biointensive growing methods, which are usually what urban ag projects do, it's researched that about 31% and 17% of our seasonal fruits and vegetables, respectively, or actually vegetables and fruits, respectively, uh, to feed a, a population of 900,000 could be supplied on less than 300 acres of land which really indicates that urban agriculture could play an important role in uh, provisioning many food supplies in urban areas. Urban farms increase vegetation, which reduce the heat island effect. They reduce the food miles by producing food close to the place where they're consumed. They tend to, toward, they tend to grow using regenerative and organic practices, which diminish the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, which by themselves require a lot of energy to produce. Regenerative agriculture contributes to healthier soils that can hold more water and more carbon and allow plants to access more nutrients while preventing aridification. So on the seven acres of urban farms that I created in my previous position, we used to cover crop every single winter which adds a whole lot of organic matter and biomicrobial mass to, uh, to create healthier soils, which are really, really great strategies to uh, be adaptive management for heat, uh, warm season heat exposure on crops. So urban farmers tend to use and generate their own compost, which is a productive reuse of organic waste uh, and thereby reduces methane emissions from landfills. They enhance rainwater infiltration they provide access to nutrient-dense food, leading to better diets and improved urban food security. And my last two points are by reducing the vulnerability of the urban poor, we can challenge the comorbidities that extreme heat shares when affecting folks with diabetes, heart disease, and obesity, which in most cases are diet-related. So in my position to help grow the urban agriculture sector throughout the state, I really do see this as a tool and a world of opportunities to begin lessening this vicious cycle that we seem to be in here. Thank you. Uh, all excellent points here. Um, and it's it's really striking uh, to what uh, Dr. Uh, Mielsen uh, said, the impact to kids are really 
potentially bad, right? Uh, we're looking at uh, the student population uh, in California in elementary school uh, being 2.7 million kids, right? Uh, going to school six hours, seven hours, eight hours a day. Um, and when we look at their play time, uh, that is also educational time uh, and foundational to how they develop as in individuals. Um, and looking at extreme heat, that's that's hazardous, right? Uh, our, our playgrounds haven't changed since however you know long we've ever been in school and our parents have been in school and our grandparents have been in school. The playgrounds have not changed at all, right? And playgrounds at that time were a lot cooler than they are now. They're becoming dangerous areas potentially right now uh, with extreme heat happening. Um, can can you talk about when when you on, on a day to day basis? What do you see on uh, you know from kids who are experiencing uh, extreme heat? Uh, or, you know, heat related illnesses from like a radiation standpoint of view, right? Like talk about like the adults are up here, right? Five, six uh, feet off the ground. Uh, kids are two, three feet off the ground with a pavement radiating at a higher temperature. What, what does that look like? What does that development uh, look like for brain development look like for the kids? Yeah, I think all all good questions. Um, so I think I mean one thing I think I'll just start out by saying is I think we are uh, entering rather uncharted territory here with extreme heat. I mean certainly I didn't go to medical school all that long ago in the grand scheme of things, and I wasn't taught anything about extreme heat, which is changing now, but it's only just changing. So I think, you know, long-term consequences, uh, we don't necessarily know. Um, so some of this is, is unfolding, you know, as we are living it. Um, in terms of, I mean, we, I spoke at the beginning about coming back to this idea that kids uh, and babies are not just little adults. Um, which is which is really relevant. We talked about you know kids are outside. They often don't necessarily know or have the ability to move to a safer area if they need to without an adult shepherding you know instructing them. Um, kids breathe at faster rates, as Juan mentioned. They're closer to the ground, so any sort of toxicity that is coming from the ground, they're going to be more exposed to, and their bodies are still developing. Right, all of their organ systems are developing, their immune systems are developing. So, things that happen to infants and and children impact their their lifespan. Um, in terms of what I'm seeing, I think one of the most profound ways that we're seeing the impact of heat on child health is really via uh, respiratory issues. So when it is hotter, we have more air pollution. There is more particulate matter there. You know, we see a whole host of respiratory issues related to that. So I think the primary thing I'm seeing, and this very much, you know, just happened a month ago, is families and schools don't aren't you know aren't aware of that linkage so i can think of at least two or three patients of mine who you know knew it was going to be hot experienced the heat it wasn't a trigger for them to start their preventative asthma medications for them to use their inhalers and they ended up with with asthma exacerbations in the case of two patients i can think of specifically missed school leaving school early missed work for parents etc um so the, you know there's obviously other manifestations of heat on health um as well in terms of you know heat Ill, you know heat related illness things like kidney problems um heat is especially dangerous actually for newborns who really aren't able to regulate their body temperature even the way older kids are that's a, an especially vulnerable population but i think for the majority of kids you know out on the schoolyard on a really hot day thinking about respiratory issues and thinking about where can those kids be moved so that they'll be safe um, or 
thinking more broadly, how can we create places that are safe for them to be outside uh, is huge. That's great. And and John, you, the state, thanks to the governor and the legislature, we have $150 million to reimagine and rethink how our school playgrounds look like, how they operate, how kids learn, how they how they experience nature in, in many ways, right? Um, how can CAL FIRE deliver multiple benefits with transforming school schools from education, climate, health, and community engagement? Well, I think all those things are intimately tied together. Um, you have to take a systematic approach, much like we do with the broader urban forest. I, I feel that places like schools are the epicenter of how we approach a systematic management of urban forests in the state. And so from a school standpoint, that's using all the available solutions that best fit the needs of that school and that community, engaging with the local neighborhood, engaging with the, the students themselves, with the staff that work there, and then making sure that they have the knowledge and ability and skill and expertise to maintain those, those green elements for the long term, because if we simply do a project and we walk away, what's the likelihood it's going to be successful? We have to teach and we have to teach both from an academic standpoint with curriculum and involving the students in the projects. Um, and we have to teach the staff why it's important, not just from a not just from a, a reading, writing and arithmetic standpoint, but from a why and how natural systems function where people's food comes from. One of the biggest challenges we have as a very urbanized state, in fact, the most urbanized state in the union by many measures, 95% um, of our population and less than 6% of our land area, um, is our urban residents are largely disconnected from the land. They don't know necessarily where their food comes from. They don't know why forests and watersheds are important to them. These are things we can show them where they live. Every city is an urban forest. It just has to be managed as critical infrastructure. We have to put importance on it. That takes a holistic approach, both at a local policy level, a local practice level, how much importance we give it and how we implement it. Our role as, as a state entity is to make sure that when we implement, we implement the right way. We provide the resources needed to get the job done. We're the enablers. We're not the doers. We're very cognizant of that. And so we're going to do whatever we can to enable that good local work to happen. And if that's sometimes stepping in from a policy perspective, we can do that. If it's enabling people by coming in and showing them how to do something or how we've seen something implemented somewhere else, we can, we can do that. If it's simply providing funding so that they can do that good work, we can do that. So there's a number of ways we can enable people, but ultimately it has to come from the community itself to be successful long-term. And Tracy, uh, you've, you've heard the, the conversation about the importance of learning for kids, the importance of uh, development, health, the importance, uh, as John was pointing out, uh, how, how they're experiencing um, schools and how to re redefine play in, in many ways. Um, LA, LAUSD is one of the largest landholders in, in LA, if not the largest landholder. What is What could reimagining these schoolyards to be more climate resilient, uh, but also water efficient, all right? Uh, what would that mean for Southern California? What kind of impact would it have? Thank you for that question. Um, at, at Heal the Bay, we get to watch kids come in, kids who, you know, sometimes have never been to the beach before. And, uh, you know, they, they pet baby sharks, they meet rays. Um, and you see the way that that uh, tactile, um, you know, education, you know, you're, you're in it with them. Um, really changes them you know you're inspiring the next generation of ocean protectors they're 
They fall in love with those animals. They now know that they're out there underneath the pier, um, that the things that they do are impacting their health, and you see the way that it changes those kids. In that same way, we can have those same experiences on our campuses. Kids could go out, there could be a beautiful bioswale surrounded by native plants where bees and hummingbirds and butterflies are there. They can learn about the water cycle, they can learn about climate change, they can learn about biodiversity, and they can see it with their own eyes. I think that's so impactful from an education perspective. So I think all of these incredible funds that are going to go to projects have to be accompanied by curriculum to really maximize what we're doing. From a water efficiency perspective, you know, we just don't have enough water for everyone to have a front lawn. And, you know, there have been efforts throughout the state to get people to incentivize people to remove their front lawns. Um, you know, I'm also sitting on the board of the Metropolitan Water District. We recently increased, uh, you know, what we're offering to get encourage people to rip that out. But people need places to play. And so schools can be a place where we can have, you know, where it's okay to have grass because it's a place for kids to run around. And, you know, really public money is going into those public schools and really should be a, a place for everyone to, you know, equitable access to, to green space. And so as we as we take grass out of people's homes or out of, you know, out of people's, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, remove it from the landscape in your homes, um, having a green space on schools is going to be really important for making sure that there are still equitable access to parks. And Sarah, you talked about the importance of urban agriculture. How can schools play a role in lessening the food inequities that, that we see across the state? Awesome, thank you. Um, so, you know, having worked in the field of urban ag for almost a decade now, one of the things that I can say is probably one of the leading needs is people who are interested or already knowledgeable in farming. For example, we have a really vibrant Hmong community that is excellent farming community. We have a lot of Latino farm workers that, you know, want to grow their own food for their community, um, but don't have that access to land. And school districts happen to be one of the largest landholders in the county. Um, not only are they the owners of the most amount of land, um, but most of the land actually already has irrigation on it. Um, there are acres and acres and acres of schools in Sacramento that I see getting irrigated and nobody's really using them. Um, so that is just a massive amount of opportunity to use that land for urban farm incubation. Um, I was able to convert an acre and a half of school district property. My, my program previous to having this position was the West Sacramento Urban Farm Program. And the third farm site that I built was an acre and a quarter on school district property. Um, it was land that had been behind a chain link fence that was getting irrigated, but the kids didn't even have access to play on it. It was just an empty field. And after about a year of negotiating with the school for an MOU to get access to that field, um, we were able to assign two beginning farmers who graduated from our training program to launch their business there. So if anyone's interested in seeing a insanely successful model of farms on schools, just look up Fiery Ginger Farm. You could ride your bike there from here. Um, they have expanded to two acres on school district property, and they've written a few grants where the farms uh, actually part of the curriculum for a book that's in the English class or for math class where they do fractions with something that has to do with the harvest um, or economics or anything. There's so many ways to integrate the things that are happening on the farm with different types of curriculum on schools. Uh, this farm is, you know, it's a business and they are selling 400 pounds of cut greens to the cafeteria every week. Um, and so it's going directly into the cafeterias. It's the kids are coming out there and picking it and then actually getting excited to eat salad because they grew it. 
Um, I think one of the things that is really challenging for schools is that teachers cannot be expected to manage school gardens. They have 8,000 jobs being social workers, being mental health care professionals, trying to teach a curriculum to a really challenging environment already. And then to ask them to make sure the plants get watered on time is really challenging. So if we can actually think constructively about using school properties as a place to incubate production urban farms, where the management of all of that and the production of those crops is actually a business opportunity for a local grower. Uh, that is like a, a quadruple bottom line on how to use school property. And also it's a really huge opportunity to start developing gray water because we should have urban orchards in schools and there's no need to use clean municipal water for a fruit tree. We can easily divert, you know, water from sinks and water from different parts of the school to irrigate urban orchards. And, and that would be a massive way to stop using treated municipal water for fruit trees. Uh, just to add on to that, um, one of the smaller parts of our urban and community forestry program is urban wood utilization. Um, when you have a population of trees in an urban area, Sometimes those trees have to be removed because they become hazardous, diseased, whatever the case may be. And traditionally, they've just been taken to the dump, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about we're sitting on a wood stage and we bought that from somewhere, probably on the East Coast or overseas. Um, and we should be thinking about that entire cycle of sustainability with everything we do from an urban forestry standpoint, from an urban agriculture standpoint, from an urban greening standpoint. So we really should be thinking about that. We don't go and remove trees in a city just to make lumber. But if the tree has to come down, why aren't we doing something useful with it? It can also be a great, great piece for biophilic design on a school campus. Like you don't have to have a jungle gym if you have a big log to play on, right? I grew up playing on big logs. It's a lot of fun. You get dirty, it's great. So. Um, we need to stop worrying about uh, spending a lot of money on 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 playground equipment and, and use what we have and let, let kids play in a more na natural environment. So this might be a, a dream question, right? Uh, if you had the opportunity to build your 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 school from your standpoint standpoint of view, what would it look like? What kind of features would it have? Essentially, asking what is, what is the design that we need from a Peter Trish's standpoint of view. I was going to say I'm going to reveal I am not an architect or a designer by any means, but. Um, Let's see. I mean, I think there, the idea of schools as a haven um, is something that resonates really deeply with me, especially during and after, well, not that we're through the pandemic, in light of everything that's happened with COVID and seeing, um, I think for all of us, how integral schools are to our communities and what happens when our kids don't have access to them. When I think of what this could look like, you know, it's a place that shows kids what's wrong, right? That's not denying that we have a problem and that, you know, climate change is happening, but that also shows them how it could be and how I think one of the mo most profound things about all of this is that the health, right, the benefits to our mental and physical health from all of the changes that we're talking about are immediate in, term, in addition to long term, right? We're talking about future generations, but we're also talking about our immediate health and the things that impact those. So food, access to green spaces, access to a comfortable environment, right? We I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but there's good data that shows that for every incremental degree, we go up in Fahrenheit, test scores come down by a certain amount. So when we're thinking holistically about what it means to be a child in school learning and thinking about health, it's really um, having a place that really embodies all of those. Um, so that's, yeah, that would be my dream. Well, since we're dreaming, um, 
I think I think my my dream school would be there would be a lot of opportunity for outdoor learning and hands on learning. Um, personally speaking, when I was in school, when I was able to actually touch things and 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 use what I had learned in the real world, it made a lot more sense to me. And I think that's something that's missing these days. So maybe there'd be classrooms where the walls could be could be retracted so you're to the open air when the weather permits. Maybe there'd be outdoor classrooms that the teachers could reserve, you know, a couple of times a week for their class. Um, maybe there would be lessons where they had to go outside to, you know, your learning area and perimeter and things like that. Why not use that when you're deciding, okay, well, we need to have a half acre garden plot. So let's figure out what the perimeter of that is, what the area of it is, how much food we might be able to produce, you know, that's a much better math lesson to me than learning that from a book. Um, and it's something that they can apply in their real life. So um, a lot more opportunity for outdoor learn, learning and outdoor play and, and teaching kids where things come from. I think when they understand that it opens the door to a broader understanding of, of not only the, the climate crisis that we face, but how we can potentially adapt. Um, so that, I guess that would be my dream. Well, I answered my dream and a little bit in the last, but I'll I'll reiterate uh, in that there is space that mimics the natural world. I think it's as easy as that. Um, I think, uh, you know, I recently saw um, a landscape, as I you know alluded to in the last answer, it had a beautiful bioswale. So when it rains, you can see the water flow through like it would be a river and it, it will inf infiltrate down. It was surrounded by incredible native plants that don't require additional irrigation, which is going to be so key uh, for making sure that we have enough water for the plants that need it. Um, and as climate change causes incredible aridification across the West, um, that that we put in place things that are going to allow um, ecosystems to thrive. Um, you know, that again, they'll see bees and birds uh, and butterflies and interact in a way that allows them to understand the importance of the natural world. Um, again, makes them fall in love with it. And we all know we, you know, we protect what we love. And so allowing kids that exposure, allowing them to interact um, with, with these places, places of learning, you know, with these, with it's opportunities for learning. I love everything that you said about, you know, getting kids outside. And, you know, I think that um, for me, there's no better place of learning than being outdoors and there's no better place for connection and belonging. I think it's incredibly helpful for not only learning about STEM stuff and learning about climate change, but also your mental health. And so I think there are multiple um, benefits from outdoor education and being exposed to that. Uh, well-designed schoolyards can also offer high quality park and green space, especially for low income communities of color. And then, you know, just to, you know, kind of pivot a little bit from that. These are also incredible opportunities for us to educate school administrators about MS4 compliance, which is super wonky, but really important for making sure that we're not polluting our waterways. Um, and then opportunities to be really innovative with how we manage our water, uh, you know, as many of the speakers have alluded to, and I think people throughout the day, although this isn't about water, um, we're in an incredible crisis here. And so having the, 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 the kids that are gonna inherit this world and have to know that they, they're gonna have to be creative about how they manage water. Um, and so getting them to learn that early on and embrace that I think is incredibly important. Thanks. Um, yeah, so what would be in a, a dream situation? Well, I guess relating to the extreme heat situation, and my brain's always on agriculture in general, um, there is an underlying fact that our farmer population in the United States is aging out of existence, essentially. Um, I think the average age of a farmer in America right now is like 59 years old, um, and that's a tough job. So it's not something you do until you're 80, usually. Um, so, you know, I think schools are an amazing platform to introduce another generation to 
to farming, but not the style of farming that necessarily relies on lots of industrial inputs, but regenerative farming practices that can actually realistically be exemplified on a quarter acre. You can have a quarter acre farm that produces 10,000 pounds of produce a month, because that's what I was doing for the last five years. Um, it's not impossible. It's, it's just something that requires a lot of training and schools are an amazing place to introduce that as potentially a CTE track, you know, a technical education track. Um, I mean, obviously one of the largest challenges is that farming is not something that most people can make a living doing. Most farmers have either a partner that is a doctor or has another job. Um, or they they farm and then they also go to a different job at some part of the week. Um, so in general, we do need to make the cultivation of healthy fruits and vegetables economically viable in this country, um, which is a huge other kind of conversation about the Farm Bill. But um, schools are also an, a pretty amazing platform for us to start honoring cultural crops. California has a really diverse population. I mean, in, in West Sacramento, most of my students or uh, customers at my mobile farmer's market were Afghani or Russian. And I had no idea that I could grow 400 pounds of okra and sell it in 30 minutes on a Tuesday. Um, so I think it's just an opportunity to really experience what food sovereignty looks like, to have control over our own seed banks and and to empower kids to understand that a quarter acre, a half acre, a one acre plot is not insignificant when it's done in a regenerative biointensive method. And, and so, yeah, that would be amazing. And because I'm not a very good timekeeper, I think we're at time, maybe we have one, uh, one uh, time for one question. Yes, we have time for one question from the public, and I think this one is applicable to all panelists. So our question is from Gabriela Fascio from the Central California Environmental Justice Network. She's joining us in person today. I have heard you all speak on efforts surrounding implementing new urban farming, urban forestry, and climate change curriculums into schools in Sacramento and the Bay. How do you think these efforts should be implemented in underserved low income communities, specifically in the Central Valley, where impacts of extreme heat are most heavily felt? I think that question might be for you, John. Well, I think the curriculum has to work for the community, not vice versa. So um, making available what we have, making available what's out there, making people aware, being willing to pay for it. Um, I think those are ways helping connect uh, school partners with other partners with expertise and curriculum. Uh, that that's that's the kind of role I can see us taking as a state agency is helping to connect people that have these resources with with people who are looking for them. Um, and then the other way, of course, is to to fund it and to also come and actually do teaching ourselves uh, with our staff, which we are fully willing to do. And with that, I think that we wrap up this uh, panel. Uh, please welcome, uh, tell, help me thank our panelists and uh, with a round of applause uh, for, for this enthralling conversation. The next panel is the health equity at the heart of extreme heat action, moderated by Leanne Dillon and uh, co-lead of the Capital Collaborative on Race and Equity at the Public Health Institute.
Good afternoon. Oh, there we go. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, as we transition to the next panel, if you want to get up and stretch or walk around, or if you need to kind of address your bodily needs, go ahead and do that. Get comfortable. Uh, my name is Leanne Dillon. Um, as the previous uh, moderator mentioned, I work um, at the Public Health Institute with the Capital Collaborative on Race and Equity for the State of Equity program. And I'm moderating this phenomenal powerhouse panel today. Um, and we're going to talk about health equity um, at the heart of uh, extreme heat action. Um, and uh, so how this panel will run is we'll do some introductions so you can get to know us better. Um, and then we'll go through kind of a discussion. And then um, there will also be a Q&A portion. And so folks in the room here with us, back of the room, that's where you're going to find your comment cards. Folks online, uh, you can submit your questions via Zoom. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm occupying uh, Nisanon land here in Sacramento, California. If you want to learn more about um, the efforts to restore their federal recognition status, you can go to um, the California Heritage Indigenous Research Project, and Shelly Covert does a great job of kind of keeping that initiative going as the spokeswoman for um, the Nevada City Rancheria. Um, let's see, what are we going to talk about? Uh, we had a really great, brief, juicy, great discussion, uh, let's see, last week, yep, about kind of what this panel would be about and how we all think about and come to health equity as it relates to extreme heat. And so, um, you know, things that came up for us, um, or came up for me as, as I was thinking. So I support state entities in California to think about how their um, work does or does not advance racial equity. And so how can we kind of dismantle institutional and structural racism within um, state entities? Uh, and so as we were talking about health equity and extreme heat, you know, a number of kind of oppressive systems were coming up in our conversations. Um, so, you know, race, ethnicity, gender, um, geography, right? Like disaggregating data by that and then looking at how are these systems kind of operating uh, related to extreme heat. So, you know, we talked about capitalism, ableism, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, colonialism, patriarchy, racism, right? And then how are those systems operating uh, at the community level, at the individual level, within policies and practices, grant programs, you know, all these different kind of levers um, that we interact with. Um, and so we are not in this panel today, in our brief time together, we are not going to figure out how to dismantle those systems. We're not actually going to do that. Um, but we're going to think about some reflections on, like, how we think about that in our work. Um, and the incredible folks that are here, you know, how then that comes up and uh, is addressed in their work with community. Okay, I'm going to have us do some introductions. We're going to start with Natalie Hernandez, who's the Director of Climate Planning and Resilience at Climate Resolve, and then you'll hear from uh, Heather Ryden, Program Director of the Western Center for Western Agricultural Health and Safety, and then Rachel Rios, Executive Director of La Familia Counseling Center. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalie Hernandez. I'm the Director of Climate Planning and Resilience at Climate Resolve. Climate Resolve is a nonprofit organization based in the Los Angeles region. We're dedicated to finding local solutions to the global a uh, problem of climate change, um, particularly extreme heat. We partner a lot with uh, grassroots advocacy groups, um, utility companies, uh, jurisdictions to find those urban cooling solutions. We are an advocacy organization at heart, so we do a lot of state and local um, advocacy for legislation. And in my role particularly, I am the Director of Climate Planning and Resilience. I partner for a lot of projects. I do technical assistance for grant programs, including um, Strategic Growth Council's Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities uh, Program, as well as Boost. I also work um, with Air Resources Board uh, to do a community-based project in the City of Commerce, where we're getting their first ever 
set of electric uh, buses, their first ever uh, bike lanes, and uh, planting 400 trees. I also um, sit on the Community Resilience Working Group. I see some of my colleagues here in the audience. It's led by Green Lining and APEN, um, and Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability is there as well. And we work to advocate that grant guidelines from the billions of dollars that the state has for climate funding are implemented in an equitable way. So happy to be here. I used to work um, for Natural Resources Agency nine years ago as a fellow, and it's really a true honor to be here in this new building. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Uh, Heather Ryden. I am the program director for the Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety at UC Davis. And our center does both research and outreach. Our research is focused on the identification of um, the, the factors that influence injury and illness in the occupational setting for agricultural workers. Agriculture is one of the most dangerous industries in the, the United States. Um, and California produces a lot of agricultural outputs. And so there is a lot of work to be done here. We also focus on outreach and training so that we can help equip farm workers and agricultural employers with practical solutions to stay safe in the workplace. We do this in partnership with community-based organizations and employers across the state um, and really focus on um, practical solutions. So accessible, we, we work in English and Spanish. We partner with organizations who use in, um, who speak indigenous languages in order to make sure that we can reach people who speak the many languages that are spoken in California agriculture. Um, and we, we really strive to work with everyone. The goal is safe, a safe work environment. And, um, and that's what uh, we hope to bring to this conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Rios. I'm the executive director of La Familia Counseling Center. And as our name says, we are a mental health counseling service agency. We provide mental health services for children zero to 21. We do short-term adult mental health services for Spanish speakers. And we also do a suicide prevention program, but that's just the beginning of what we do for the community. We are one of the America's job centers. So we look uh, to do job fairs and place people in employment as well as out of school youth in internships. We have two schools. We have adult ed, GED, ESL, and then we have an alternative high school on our main campus. We do parenting classes. We do, we work with strengthening families, uh, domestic violence, early learners, school readiness, and we do health programs. We do, we've been involved with a lot of chronic disease management, um, COVID obviously with a lot of COVID um, outreach, looking at those issues. And then we do a lot of what our work is really around youth, strengthening families and helping young people become resilient adults. And so we do a lot of leadership programs. We do internships. We even work at the youth detention facilities. So what does a nonprofit like La Familia have to do with climate issues and heat resiliency? We're, we are in the middle of Franklin Boulevard. And for those of you who are in Sacramento, you will recognize that that was nominated one of the ugliest streets in Sacramento some years back. And that's because there is no tree, tree canopies, there's no shade. So we've been dealing with heat and heat resilience for a long time. We work with the agricultural community, we work with our farm workers, and so we have some experience with this. And more recently, we've been working with our state, federal, and local um, policyholders in developing what we're calling a resiliency hub at our main site. So I'm looking forward to talking with you today. Thank you. I'm so excited to hear more about your work. And I'm remembering so many different facets of my work. I worked on um, urban greening here in the city of Sacramento um, and across the state. And also um, I'm reminded of my work doing climate change policy at the um, San Diego County Health Department. So um, yeah, just 
loving thinking about this with you all. So our first kind of discussion point is around, you know, what is the impact of heat on the communities that we work with? And, you know, from a public health standpoint, right, we think about like um, disease burden or we think about hospital admissions when we have an extreme um, heat event and then morbidity and mortality within that. Uh, and so for you all in your work, how are you thinking about what those impacts are? And then um, how do you see kind of these like legacy policy impacts? So decisions that were made either a long time ago or maybe just yesterday. Um, and what are the impacts of those then on your ability to um, address kind of then those health impacts of heat? Thanks, Leanne. So I kind of have uh, two pieces to this question, like what are the heat impacts on the communities that I see and work with, and then also the policies um, that have kind of caused those communities to bear the brunt of the um, heat impacts. So um, first, in you, you talked a little bit about the systemic issues and in um, the urban environment, redlining and disinvestment in neighborhoods in the LA region has really led um, to some communities having a temperature difference. So um, it's hotter in poorer communities versus richer communities. And that might be, be because um, communities that have been disinvested have less tree canopy and have less park space. And so if we compare um, South LA with Beverly Hills, which are like two um, neighborhoods in LA County that really are the rich and the poor, they uh, deal with some of those disparities. And it's there are heat, urban heat islands where low income communities, um, as I'm mentioning, have more dense areas that have those fewer trees, less green space, but it's also more buildings, um, higher energy use, and more impervious asphalt and concrete. Um, so these characteristics make areas up to 22 degrees higher in the nighttime than surrounding areas. And when you look at the vulnerabilities and map them out, they uh, map onto areas of historical residential residential segregation and redlining. Um, so most recently, LA County published their LA County vulnerability assessment. Client Resolve was involved in the work on that um, through stakeholder engagement and found that subpopulations um, that were most vulnerable to extreme heat included outdoor workers, such as those that work in construction, landscapers, domestic labor, um, and street vendors. It also included uh, people experiencing homelessness and those without shelter and those on the streets. And for two of these populations that I just mentioned, uh, they have a greater risk of exposure to extreme heat, but also um, heat illness and heat exhaustion. And the underlying issues that I'll kind of end with is uh, poverty for people living in poverty. The urban heat island effect is compounded by poor housing conditions. So if they wanted to use air conditioning, um, there might be a lack of air conditioning or um, a fear of using the air conditioning due to the high energy costs. And so as far as the, the policies and what could be done or what wasn't done, uh, for Climate Resolve, we've seen that policymakers didn't provide a central approach to heat, but rather heat was a secondary um, co-benefit to GHG reductions. There's been a piecemeal approach and a fragmented approach, and the root cause of the urban heat island hasn't still been addressed. Um, past decisions by state have not been coordinated, and there hasn't been uh, one program yet to address extreme heat, though there have been for other climate programs like sea level rise, um, drought, and wildfire. Uh, I am happy to say that the first ever extreme heat and climate resilience program is coming soon through OPR and Climate Resolve help advocate for that program. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I wanna repeat something that I heard said this morning by some of the epidemiologists, which is a reminder that heat illness and the negative health effects of it are preventable. So this is something that we, we don't actually have to accept. Um, and so I think that's an important reminder when we're talking about the, the negative health outcomes that any of the vulnerable populations that we're talking about are experiencing. This isn't something that we just um, need to be okay with. This is ex entirely preventable and therefore unacceptable. Um, and so in terms of farm workers, some of the policy implications or the, the landscape in which agricultural workers are experiencing heat illness are in the context of, um, uh, you know, uh, 
um, their largely immigrant status and or it, from, coming from immigrant families that might have mixed immigrant status where fear of government is a real um, and lived experience that results in fear of interacting with government and government-like entities. So um, not only may they not have access to healthcare, they are may, may be fear of interacting with the healthcare system. Um, there may be fear in reporting issues around um, workplace conditions that, um, May, you know, they might be fearing um, reporting unsafe work conditions out of fear of retaliation. Uh, and so there are those kinds of social determinants of health, other workplace conditions that um, their immigrant status can really um, create a larger system in which they're operating that makes it even more dangerous for them greater than the, the heat itself. It's also important to remember that farm workers have extremely low wages across the year. And that means that um, putting food on the table and paying rent can become the greater priority than not working because without working, they won't get paid. Um, and so we have um, from focus groups and conversations with farm workers often heard that they, they need to push through. They will push themselves through because they need to pay that um, rent or put food on the table. And so we have multiple different layers of pressures that farm workers report facing um, when they're considering their health outcomes. Thank you. I just wanna um, piggyback on, on what you just said. You know, in our work with farm workers um, uh, around COVID, Oftentimes, we found farm workers who refused to stay home, even though they had COVID, because they did not want to lose their job. So we really had to engage the farmers to tell the farmers that we would support them and help them um, to please tell the, the worker that they could stay home and they weren't going to lose their job. So you're absolutely right about that health issue. And also, you know, we heard about redlining and disadvantaged communities. Really, it's about poverty, race, and space, as Dr. Hernandez says it. Um, so we know that disadvantaged communities have disparate incomes, uh, impacts. No matter what the social problem or issue is, they are going to carry the brunt of those things. And we know that there have been these longstanding patterns of disinvestment that are often racially centered, and they've created these health disparities, the income inequality, and neighborhood vulnerabilities. These are things that we've known for a long time. And many of the families that we're working with have been working and living in these conditions for a very long time. And you do see the impacts. You see the impacts in their children's ability to learn. You see their impacts in health conditions, higher health conditions in these communities. And so you see the income in our senior citizens that live in these communities, not being able to afford air, not being able to, to um, live comfortably. So other examples of communities that are impacted by this are, you know, as we talked about, not having um, tree canopies, not having parks. I think we heard before about utilizing schools as opportunities for green spaces. Well, in Sacramento, about seven, eight years ago, seven schools were closed all in disparate communities. And so where did those kids go? We were fortunate to be able to take one of those schools and repurpose it and make it into a neighborhood center. But what about the rest of the schools? And what about those children? Where do they go for after school to be able to have green space? There are no parks in our area. There are no cooling centers like libraries or malls where people can go to kind of recreate, stay out of the heat. And these are conditions, again, that our communities have been living under for years. So when we talk about extreme heat, again, we want to remember that the, these are things that people have been forced to adapt for a long time. And so it shouldn't be a surprise when you have an event that the impact is going to be felt more heavily in these communities. So when we think about lived outcomes, again, you know, we go back to the poverty, 
race, and space. Without having that built infrastructure in these communities, without having investments in these communities, we're never going to get out of this situation. And you're going to have communities that are feeling the brunt of this in many ways. And to some extent, then we all feel that, right? Because if our children are having, if our families are having um, mental health issues, if they're having, you know, lower birth rates or birth outcomes or the workability, we're all going to feel that as a society and as a community. Thank you. What I'm holding um, from this conversation is the piece around like that human cost, right? We're talking about moments of lives that are cut short, years of lives, decades of lives. Um, and so just wanting to like pause and um, hold that, you know, we're here in this very comfortable auditorium. It is not a hot day. Um, and we're talking about, you know, the cost of human life that happens in these extreme heat events and then the legacy impacts of that. And also thank you for naming the piece around the preventability um, of this and, and thus our responsibility, right, to do something about it. Um, thank you all. I think our next question, tech fail on my part. No, no. Our next question is about, oh yeah. Okay, so now we understand like the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, so what are the emerging opportunities then to address heat inequitable impacts and build heat resilience? Um, and how can government work to counteract the injustices in policies and programs moving forward? I have thoughts on this, but I want to hear y'all's thoughts. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, Taylor, I think this is where I might need my slides if they're still available. Oh, okay, cool. They are here. Uh, yes, so while providing um, air conditioning is an immediate relief to a lot of people, um, either in their apartment or their home as an escape to extreme heat. It also keeps people autonomized and air conditioning vents hot air outdoors, adding to the urban heat island effect. By contrast, there are community-wide solutions that can be implemented, um, things that build social cohesion like resilience hubs, uh, neighbors checking in on neighbors, planting trees, green cities, deploying cool pavement strategies, and more drinking fountains. So I pulled up um, a picture of our resilience hub that Client Resolve is working on and piloting in Boyle Heights. Um, it really is run by the Boyle Heights, Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory, and we are a partner in helping them out with their resilience curriculum, uh, both for youth and elders. Um, they have now infrastructure upgrades, um, like a backup energy. Uh, system, uh, system and, and the, the space, space is used both on a daily basis and is being activated for emergency use. So Client Resolve has seen that that cooling centers sometimes aren't, aren't popular. Um, we want them to be fun and not boring. There should be rewarding programming going on and a place that people are familiar with that they can go to um, in extreme heat. So that, that is one uh, solution that, that we're piloting and an emerging opportunity. Uh, if you go to the next slide, there's also work that we're doing to think about how to make parks cool spaces. Um, this is a picture um, here on, on the top uh, right of someone that went out to the Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Center during the September heat wave. It was in the LA Times and it was talking about where people went to cool off. Um, so um, so resolve. consequently, we just finished up a Baldwin Hills Community Resilience and Access Plan, where we were thinking about if people are going to parks already, they're familiar spaces, how could we make them more resilient with amenities such as shade structures, water, um, uh, Wi-Fi, and, and charging stations. So that's what the picture up there shows. And um, again, these are emerging opportunities that I think the state can support. And, um, you know, through their grant programs, these are things that can be funded. I love that. I love seeing actual examples. Congratulations. Um, okay, I like, I also like talking about opportunities and solutions. So um, I hope that this day results in many new ideas that can be shared. Um, I, I have a few thoughts and I would also add that I think 
for agriculture and agricultural workers and communities, the best thing to do is talk to farm workers, talk to community groups, talk to employers, talk to the people who are on the ground doing the work. Um, and they they have the solutions um, and are the ones who are living in in the spaces. And so I would recommend having them um, leading the conversations. First, um, I would say that our work at the Agri Western Center for Ag Health and Safety is very much in this space on outreach and training. I, I believe outreach and training are important, but they it's it, not where the solution is going to be. We need to be thinking about how to actually change systems and structures. Um, in in the, some examples of that could be transportation, for example, a, a farm worker who is working in 110 degree heat uh, for eight to 10 hours shouldn't be getting in an, a car that is full of five to six other people that doesn't have air conditioning to then drive an hour home um, to go into a non-air conditioned house where they live with another one or two families to be in a hot home all night, not ever be able to cool off to then go back to the hot workplace the next day. Cooling off, getting your body cool overnight is really critical to um, reducing the risk of heat illness. So I think we should be thinking about solutions that are holistic. Um, so include the workplace, include things like Cal OSHA enforcement and getting that really strong and having the that stick. Maybe think about um, incentives. How can we think about incentivizing the water, shade, rest part of um, that important workplace policy? Right. I don't know what the incentive should be for workers and employers who have really good programs. Um, so do the carrot and the stick there, maybe think about transportation, cooling when you're on your way home. Having a better farm worker housing is, is a real challenge statewide. We know California housing is hard for everybody. It's incredibly difficult for farm workers because of their low wages. Um, and and then I think that research has to be part of the mix. We still are trying to have a better understanding of which workers under which conditions are at greatest risk of um, heat illness. And um, knowing that can help us tailor our outreach and our um, interventions even better. So I think that sort of whole approach, multifaceted, is going to be critical. Some great ideas. So you know, we know that the pandemic underscored the vulnerabilities and disparities that we already knew existed. But something that we should also know is that many of these communities were resilient. And despite the lack of formal investments, they found ways to bring health to them. So to me, that is an amazing opportunity, is to look at the fact that our families, our older adults and our youth, they have so much strength and beliefs in their connection, and they show up for one another, and that can build success. And that's something that I hope that we capitalize on being able to build on that resiliency. So some of the things that we're working on is um, we are working with the business district. They've been working for the last maybe five or 10 years on creating a, a streetscape, a, a better streetscape, more walkability, you know, a road diet on the area. And so we're working with them on that project, as well as, as I mentioned, our, our Opportunity Center, which is a center that will provide training, that will be able to provide uh, businesses in the area with new opportunities for different types of jobs that are more environmentally. So for example, electric vehicle repair, taking some of the vehicle shops that we have there on Franklin and converting them so that we have sustainable communities and economic growth, right? And then also we're looking with our um, state and local partners and federal partners to be able to create a resiliency hub. I'm happy to know you're doing the Boyle Heights because I'll be tapping into you for some expertise. Um, but looking at how we also utilize our young people in a resiliency core training so that they can be the ambassadors for the community. So it's really a different way of reframing our young people and having them be part of the solution. And the other thing we're doing is we're working with Parks and Recs right now on a project with different community partners called on a project called Junto Safuera Together Outside. And the project is about getting people, communities of color, out into public parks and waterways. So 
we have a saying that we say, let's sneak the learning in. And that means that they're having fun, they're going on a field trip, but what we're really doing is exposing them to the environment. We're teaching them how to be physically involved, walking, hiking. We're also showing them the healing, you know, um, propensities of nature, right? But we're also giving them opportunities to look at careers in these areas and more importantly, to become stewards of our environment so that they can come back to their communities and say, why can't I have that? Why can't I have a walking track? Why can't we have some streams? So really looking at a lot of different efforts to be able to do that. And I do see that there's a lot of opportunities right now with that government, there's a lot of resources to partner with communities. There's an interest in working with communities locally and having these, these um, solutions be community driven. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I love that. And I loved how it tied all together from the resiliency hub piece to, um, yeah, getting kids to parks, but the parks should be shaded and, you know, with the best amenities to support their access. Um, and also centering the voices of those kind of most impacted, right? And so how can we, how can we power share in government with these communities that we are directly trying to serve and benefit and that are at the center of experiencing the injustice. So I love that all. And then also the picture of, I know it as Kenny Hahn Park, but I grew up going there and fishing for crawdads with like a string and a little piece of bacon. And so I love that you brought that, brought that in and brought me back into my childhood. Um, okay, so kind of looping back uh, we have a few more minutes for discussion before we transition to the questions. Um, and so if you have questions that are popping up, now would be the time to start submitting them. Or if you haven't thought of a question, now's the time to think of them. Um, and so, uh, you know, kind of looping back to some of the challenges that are like, you know, we talked about the key populations that we are trying to center um, or are centering in this. And then we talked about what are some of the solutions. And so this is like, okay, why aren't we, like what's happening? Why aren't we getting there? Um, and then in particular, um, are there ways that government or state government um, can help support in like addressing some of these big challenges? Yes, yeah, so I think this is the state's first ever extreme heat symposium, which is great. Um, we need the state to start acting like extreme heat is really um, a threat to public health now, that there be a sense of urgency. We had the hottest, um, maybe longest extreme heat wave this summer, um, and it's only getting worse and it's affecting communities of color. Um, the extreme heat conversation has now been elevated in the media too, which, um, you know, is a good thing to kind of get people aware before and prepare. Uh, but those solutions to extreme heat need to be community wide and address public health interventions. Um, what we've seen at Climate Resolve with the state and with government is there's funding delays. There's all these grant programs that have been passed and, you know, we're really excited about them, uh, but we needed them yesterday. and. Um, the grant programs sometimes aren't prioritizing extreme heat uh, strategies, so we're always pushing for them to have more of those. Um, and then there's a difficulty in applying to grant programs. A lot of them are reimbursement based. And I know the state just passed uh, advanced pay legislation that um, gives up to 25%, but we need more. Um, it's really hard for small jurisdictions and nonprofits to even consider a grant program because um, they are reimbursement based and they have to provide those funds up front. Um, yeah, smaller jurisdictions also, we work with them at Climate Resolve through um, the regional climate collaboratives, um, in particular, the Inland SoCal Climate Collaborative, and they let us know that sometimes smaller jurisdictions feel like the funding programs aren't for them, because um, they don't see them coming, and only the well-connected jurisdictions might know about them. So the state can be a partner in getting that the word out about those grant programs and actually providing accurate timelines of when that funding is going to come out. The other thing is ensuring equitable engagement as a part of these programs. Um, I think that's really important in the grant guidelines that there's no, um, you know, hard funding caps on how much. And it's also really good to have good participant incentives. I don't know if you know this, but it's really hard to get like food and water, uh, like 
by a grant. So if I'm having like a field trip in the park and I want to feed folks and we're talking about extreme heat, that can't be funded yet by, um, you know, the, the state grant. And it's, and it's water, you know, water is like just providing jugs of water. And, and so I can't even get reimbursed for that. And so I, I think that's a challenge of trying to get to the root um, answer of that. And I'm not sure why that is, but we could uh, start to get grant programs to at least fund food and water. That would be great. Um, equitable engagement, I think it's, it's related that we should also have programming costs as a part of grants. Um, so even if there is infrastructure built, that there be programming after that allows the infrastructure to um, continue on, as well as maintenance, co maintenance costs. So um, not just programming after uh, the grant funded effort is built, but also maintenance. And I think that's it. Yeah, I, I, I hear all of that. <laughs> Um, and, and yet I, I want to actually sort of do what I, I keep trying to do coming out of hopefully coming out of COVID, which is finding grasping for the silver linings. Um, I think I might spend the rest of my life trying to find silver linings of COVID. And I think one of them has been finding amazing new partners um, across the state. And some of them within the state um, with the Labor Workforce Development Agency and others um, that have allowed for us to have some really great um, connections to form contracts with community-based organizations and others that um, have made it possible to build longer standing relationships that I think what would be amazing is if we can leverage those relationships and contracts built through COVID and not lose that momentum and be able to apply it to heat and to wildfires. And I think that the state sees those opportunities and I hope that they latch onto that because we really have invested collectively, the state has invested so much in its COVID response and hopefully has learned quite a bit and to be able to apply those lessons learned, including the importance of things like water and um, you know, some promotional materials to help engage um, the public is really important. I also wanted to flag that um, you know, some, some of the biggest challenges I think we face are that these are structural barriers, there are structural barriers and structures and systems are hard to change. And yet heat and extreme heat is an urgent present day problem. And so we need to figure out what are some of the short term immediate changes that we can put into place tomorrow while we are also trying to make those, you know, big course correcting changes that might take a little bit longer. And so I, we need to be moving on multiple fronts at, at different speeds, but all at the same time. Thank you, thank you both. So, you know, it's important to remember that this is not just a community issue, this is a public health issue. And so we need those investments, you know, and it's also not siloed. No family lives thinking about just one issue. This impacts everything, right? So if there's challenges with heat that are triggered, you know, that trigger health challenges, those are going to trigger financial challenges, which are going to impact families and, and children. So this is, it's, it's important for us to look at it from a holistic point of view. It's not just one issue impacting our lives. It's really a lot of issues, right? And it goes back to environment, economy, equity. So we have become good at, at you know, overcoming adversity. These communities have been living under these conditions for many, many years, for generations. We've been, we've overcome them. We've, we're working through them. We haven't overcome them, but we're working through them, right? But we need to have those larger investments and we need to have those partnerships. That is absolutely the silver lining out of COVID is how communities stepped up, promotoras, community health workers, to, to support each other the government could not have done it alone, and the government won't be able to do it alone in this case either, but communities should not be asked to do it alone either. So we need those investments. We need those investments in the infrastructure. We need those investments in jobs and training. We need those investments in making sure that their community is centered at the beginning, that the solutions are based on local level needs. And we also need to look at things differently. 
So many times in grants, we look at evidence-based practices. I want to introduce a new term, and that's community-defined evidence practice. In mental health circles, we've been working on this CDEPS for the last five, six years, doing some research projects with California Department of Public Health as well. And one of the things that hopefully the findings will come out this year that we are learning and that we always knew that cultural communities have practices that work. But a lot of times in grant applications, that's not included. They're, they're excluded from applications because they don't have evidence-based practices. Many of those EVPs were not normed on our communities. So I would say to stay local federal governments, look at including community-defined evidence practices. That's what happened with the pandemic. We used community-defined practices, right? There was no playbook. Community knew what they needed to do to get their community out there, get vaccinated, get tested to protect themselves. So look at those in creating the grant opportunities. Definitely work with your community partners and recognize there's not a one-size-fits-all. Even within a city, what we need on Franklin Boulevard is different from what Del Paso needs and both have a lot of needs, but we need to look at them differently because we're different communities in terms of what we already have in infrastructure and what are their needs. So being able to be flexible, being able to um, complete, you know, com completely involve community folks and the partnership is super important. Wow, what if we centered humans and the human experience in government and how government functions. Things like food and water were paid for. Things like relationship building was elevated and centered and storytelling and experience and wisdom of and from community is what directed decision-making. It would be transformative. Wow, thank you all so much. Do we have questions? Yes, we do have questions. Um, so Rachel, in your comments, one of the things you mentioned was that a lot of the communities you work with have, you know, exhibited and continue to be heat resilient. And so this is a question for all of you when thinking into the future in terms of like, what are heat resilient communities to you? What are you striving for in your work on, you know, a higher level? And where do you hope we can be as we continue to face the impacts of climate change? So we're looking to just have a park. We have no park on Franklin Boulevard. We have no park anywhere in the area. We're looking to have shade. So a quick story, when we um, took the Maple Center, which is the school, our main site is like a mile away. And we kept saying, oh, we're all gonna get in shade because we're gonna walk over there for you know different things. We can't walk over there. It is extremely hot to walk over there and it's not a safe street because the traffic is just going so fast. So we need to have infrastructure and safe communities. We need to value our communities. You know, we just talked about how resilient these people are, how much they want to be a part of our communities. And so we need to one, just recognize them, see them value them and then value their community in the space where they live right invest in that have schools in the neighborhood have just a park again just a park and trees and just the environment that we have in nice neighborhoods just even here in downtown right we need to do some of that but again it's about our leadership making those commitments we feel fortunate that in Sacramento, we have had some of those partnerships and we are looking forward to what Franklin Boulevard looks like in the next five years. I think I'll take this from um, a, a workplace perspective, thinking about the, a high heat spell and what it might mean for an agricultural crew that needs to work, say, um, you know, a really early shift. So sometimes people come in still when it's dark, um, in order to try to leave the fields before it gets really hot. And so I think a, an ideal situation might be one in which it's, um, you know, we're, we're meeting the nighttime um, and dark regulations for, for lighting. So people are safe working in darkness. Um, 
they can get to work okay safely because they probably woke up at like three or four in the morning so that's hard um their family isn't disrupted from the odd hours of of what you know we some of us maybe work strange hours you know so all the impacts that heat can have on families and the shifting of schedules the um and then you know the, the safe work environment during the heat coming home on a odd work schedule so thinking about how all of those different factors can be accounted for um on on a regular basis is i think the kind of thing we need to think about in a workplace whether it's agricultural workers or in other outdoor work um, environment um, and how that can affect uh, the work community Leanne, you mentioned earlier that heat waves are a really traumatic experience, and I agree, and I feel it as we're talking about all these impacts and we're in a, a air-conditioned room, but I know what it was like in September, and it was, I was thinking about all my family members, a lot of them are outdoor workers, I was thinking about my community members who were elderly, and it was like, I, I think a heat resilient um, you know, community looks like one where folks can go to somewhere safe to cool off and they can feel okay either going to work or not going to work and if they work outdoors and don't work that they get paid there's you know hazard pay and um you know that folks are checking in on their neighbors so it, it really is i think for me about like safety in those extreme heat events and that everyone has somewhere to go and they feel okay going there they know where to go Thank you. I believe that's time for this panel. Okay. Thank you all. I'm going to welcome up the final panel, the road ahead. So Jonathan Parfrey, Kristen Torres, Sarah Schneider, and Dr. Harvey. Hello. Hi, I'm Jonathan Parfrey, Director of uh, uh, Climate Resolve. Uh, this is the last panel of the day. And because it's the last panel of the day, we need to get a little energy. So may I ask you, please, could you just stand up for a second? And OK, some of you know a half moon, right? And then bend the body back. Just a little, just to get the blood moving. Thank you. I, I, I think we promise that this is going to be an exciting and lively session. It is worth hanging in there. Yes. So um, I'm going to give like very brief introductory remarks, and then we're going to go down the line and do self introductions. And then we'll start in on the presentations. How's that sound? Great. Okay. So um, Dr. David Eisman, who was up here earlier, and he's standing in the back of the room, is one of the lead authors of a study that was done in uh, Los Angeles. And he was joined by um, uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence Kalkstein, the University of Miami, and Edith de Guzman at UCLA and a host of others. And this is what was their area that they were looking at. What if we really invested in reflective surfaces in Los Angeles? What if we really focused in on cool roofs, cool walls, cool pavement, and planted a whole bunch of trees? And you know what they discovered? That they could delay the impacts of climate change in Los Angeles by cooling it down for 20, 30 years, delay the impacts of climate change if they had a, an aggressive uh, cooling regimen. And so we're here to talk about the promise of cool pavements, the promise of cooling down entire neighborhoods through cool roofs, cool walls, cool pavements. And we also heard from Dr. Eisenman earlier today that the current assessment of illness and injury from extreme heat 
is, is about 10 times more than the official statistics. And so the investments that we make in protecting ourselves could yield a great uh, return on that investment. Uh, cool pavements, according to studies I've seen, could potentially reduce air pollution by cooling down areas so that the nitrogen oxides don't convert into ozone. Uh, I've seen studies by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab that says if you have cool roofs and, and then there's a garden nearby, you use less water in that garden because it cools down the entire area. I've seen uh, studies that talk about reflective pavements that can reduce the voltage that is used uh, in street lamps because it's brighter. You don't have to use as much electricity to brighten up a, a street at night. And then uh, I hope we get into talking about this concept of albedo, reflectivity, getting at the very heart of the climate crisis itself by sending shortwave radiation, bouncing it back into space, and that it has a very salutary impact. It, that's the equivalent of reducing uh, carbon emissions. And you can even calculate how bouncing shortwave radiation is equivalent to CO2. So there's the promise. And with every promise, it gets complicated. And so that's where our panel is going to go from the big promise down to the, the interesting stuff as it gets implemented. And to start us off is Kristen Pollan. Introduce yourself. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Torres Pauling. I'm a sustainability program director at the County of Los Angeles. I'm a former state employee. I used to work at the California Air Resources Board and have served at various levels of government since then. Um, our team uh, is a relatively new part of county government. If you look back at our 100 year history, um, the Chief Sustainability Office was created um, by board motion in 2016 with the chief with the core purpose of delivering and articulating a uh, vision for what sustainable Los Angeles meant to county to the county um, to the 10 million person region to the 100,000 plus employee base to the 35 plus departments um, to to uh, coalesce around goals strategies and actions it turned out. Um, so that's a, that's an overview of, of who we are, and you might imagine that extreme heat has a touch to do with that. So I'll pass it on to Sarah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Sarah Schneider. I'm the Deputy Director of the Cool Roof Rating Council, or the CRRC for short. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's most notably known for evaluating and labeling what we call the radiative property, so solar reflectance, also known as albedo and thermal emittance of roofing products and exterior wall materials. So we're focused on the, the skin of the building and how it can work double duty to um, protect the occupants of the building as well as the surrounding community when utilized in, uh, in aggregate. So um, as a 501c3, we are um, obliged to provide a public service and we do that through our product ratings, which I'll talk about in a moment as well as technical research and very importantly education so we have a mission to raise awareness among the general public and all the various stakeholders um, about the impacts of reflective building services in terms of reducing building energy use but very importantly and um, relevant today's today's conversation how it can help reduce the impacts of the urban heat island effect, which is being exacerbated by climate change, um, which is evidenced obviously by this very recent um, extreme heat event here in California. I will disclose that I live in Portland, Oregon, and um, last summer we hit a, an all time historic record. I'm originally from the desert. I'm from the Mojave Desert. So high heat is something that's very normal to me growing up as a, as a kid in the desert. We reached 116 degrees in Portland, Oregon with high humidity. And what we heard earlier today from the epidemiologists is that it's not just heat or extreme heat, it's heat magnified by humidity. That's where you really are seeing um, issues. And, and places like um, Portland, Oregon, the Pacific Northwest, and the coastal cities uh, as, well as well as the disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities all across California, there is a lack of 
um, understanding of how to behave in heat, as well as a lack of infrastructure. A lot of what we heard about today has been focused on trees and vegetation, which is incredibly important. There are so many benefits that come with vegetation and green space. What we barely heard today is about how we can utilize other solutions like reflective building materials, so cool roofs, cool exterior walls and cool pavements as low hanging fruit to achieve a lot of the same cooling benefits um, that trees and vegetation and other solutions can provide. Um, I do want to note that um, we are the um, the state of California supervisory entity for um, the roofing code requirements for the state. So we're in Title 24, Part 6 and Part 11, Cal Green. So essentially, um, CRC rated products are required for compliance in the state of California. They're mandated in the county and city of LA, um, as well as in <laughs> Chula Vista and other jurisdictions that have adopted reach codes that have more stringent requirements. The CRC also um, provides a public database, a directory of rated roofing products. Um, this is a free online resource to the public. We're the only entity in the United States or in almost the entire world that provides such a, a database, and that's where you can go, where policymakers can go um, when evaluating various policy options, um, and where local governments, importantly, can go for compliance and enforcement of any mandates around urban heat island mitigation with the use of cool roofs or cool walls, or building energy efficiency requirements with the use of cool roofs and cool walls. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to... Oh, It's coolroofs.org. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is John Harvey. I am uh, uh, teach at UC Davis in civil and environmental engineering. I'm also the director of the University of California Pavement Research Center, which does a lot of the work for Caltrans, Federal Highway Administration, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, also the director of the city and county pavement improvement center. Uh, CCPIC, which we created five years ago, working with the League of California Cities and the California State Association of Counties to try and build uh, better pavement expertise at the local government level, doing a lot of outreach right now and training and uh, cool pavements is one of the things that we talk about in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, the short description of what I do is um, if it's hard, flat and on the ground, uh, we're working on it, whether it's the environment, uh, economics, and 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 just uh, keeping it all going. And that's included uh, quite a bit of work on complete streets and active transportation and sporadic work as funding becomes available, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about, um, on um, cool pavements and getting them from sort of the really beginnings that we're at right now and and, and kind of a few dots of data and information and getting to where we really understand them and can really move them forward in a, in a sustainable way. Well, thank you so much, panel. And I see I promised it would be lively, and it is. So, Kristen, we're going to start with you. At LA County, you have a tremendous sustainability plan, You have uh, which has some climate resilience elements in it. You have a tremendous uh, climate vulnerability assessment. You have um, a, a really great uh, climate um, action plan and climate adaptation plan for the unincorporated parts of LA County. Could, could you describe what LA County, the nation's largest county, is doing to protect its people from extreme heat? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jonathan, Jonathan for, for framing it so, I think, holistically, because <laughs> I was going to take it there anyways. I know we're here to talk about surfaces. Um, but, I mean, really, I wanted to go back to the first point that you raised of the Our County Sustainability Plan, um, which is the name of that vision document that I referenced at the top of my intro. Um, that process, that document is the nation's most ambitious regional sustainability plan, and it I incorporated resilience and equity in every part of the plan. There's not a resilience section. Um, we, I just checked, reference heat 85 times in that plan. 
Um, so it is not an insignificant part of what was on our minds and what was on the mind of our stakeholders. Um, so the sustainability plan, we didn't put a draft together until we did about a, a year of listening. So I think I've heard that as a theme today is to listen to communities. And I think that is why we see extreme heat and climate vulnerability in general, which led to the climate vulnerability assessment that released uh, we released just about a year ago and pointed out really stark findings, especially on extreme heat. Um, so I think that the interest uh, in this topic for us is that LA County residents are worried about this topic and brought it up as a, as a central tenant of what they wanted the county to accomplish. Um, so, I mean, I can give a very specific example of what we're doing um, on October 4th, um, the board approved a motion directing um, action on cooling strategies at facilities like Kennethon Park, which was on the slide a second ago. Um, and I don't think that's the last thing you'll see out of our board in the, even in the next month, um, directing action on extreme heat. Um, so I think it, it reflects sort of this community listening, um, responding to, I'm so glad we opened with the, the point um, from our state scientists around extreme heat being the number one killer. Right, I think we we that is that is like we have to do substantive action at every level of government, and we need an unprecedented level of coordination. Given that extreme heat touches um, literally every county department, um, so what are we doing? We're actually doing a very behind the scenes um, activity of um, identifying where in the county every county department has to had to report on um, through their department head of performance evaluation process, what they are doing to and how much extreme heat is costing their department. So I think that'll start leading to, oh, how many buildings have we put cool roofs on? <laughs> um, how far are we? And so the our county sustainability plan also has um, targets, quantitative targets around um, how we're going to define success related to extreme heat. They are both sort of surfaces and built environment related. So we have a 2025 goal of converting 10% of heat trapping surfaces to either cool or green surfaces um, based on our 2014 data baseline. But we also have a human health target. So we, we say, okay, we, we know as a county, we have jurisdiction over a lot of buildings and land. Let's, let's, that's a giant asset and parks. And those are places where people go, especially the most vulnerable. But we also have, let, let's identify and and prioritize human health. And I think I'll reference our comments um, to the state that we submitted on the extreme heat action plan. And we said, all these priorities are, are so important, um, but we need to elevate human health above all the other ones. I don't think that comment was <laughs> totally incorporated as, as ambitiously as it could have been. Um, so we are still, as the public health department, as the, as the county's public health department, very interested in making sure that whatever we do protects human health. So we're we're going for, we're updating our urban forest management plan, thanks to CAL FIRE. We are doing, we have the, I think I was going to say this to make sure Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong. I still say it, nobody tells me I'm wrong. The nation's most ambitious cool roofs ordinance. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of things. Uh, and we're we're trying to investigate whether depaving and how depaving could be deployed and in, in what communities um, as a, as a means to um, achieving that conversion of heat trapping services target. A lot of things is a short answer. Thank you very much. And Sarah, we're going to uh, ask you to describe, you know, in greater detail the work of the Cool Roof Rating Councils at CoolRoof CoolRoofs.org, and to uh describe how your relationship with the state of california and maybe you could describe how title 24 chapter 6 works and no seriously i know it's a it's a kind of a detailed ish question but there's like los angeles county went and petitioned the california energy commission to actually increase the uh solar reflectance of its steep slope uh, roofs and built that into their building code and the city of LA has matched them at 0.25 solar reflectance, which I think is more than what the state of California is currently uh, mandating through uh, Title 24, Chapter 6. So a little detail, please. I knew you would go off script. Um, so. <laughs> 
Um, well, first, I want to say that um, the CRC, even though we are a 501c3 nonprofit, we are not an advocacy organization. So we rely heavily and are very appreciative of other nonprofits um, out there that are doing that that hard work to to advocate for legislation, for regulations for programs, incentives, et cetera. So we thank Climate Resolve um, and others for doing that work for us. So we are essentially a data clearinghouse. We orchestrate the, um, the testing, weathering, and rating of roofing materials and exterior wall materials. And as I said earlier, that data is published in online databases that are accessible to the public, policymakers, um, not just in California and not even just in um, the United States, but across everywhere except for the EU, <laughs> rely on the data in that directory of over 3,000 roofing products that are rated. Um, and so we publish the measured solar reflectance and thermal emittance values. Th solar reflectance, thermal emittance are the two radiative property metrics that are used to determine how efficient a roofing material 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 or an exterior wall material are and essentially reflecting incoming solar radiation so the sunlight that hits the surface and this is really important because when a surface material is able to reflect incoming solar radiation it means that that solar energy is not 100 percent entering the building as heat so therefore occupants in air-conditioned spaces um, will experience more comfort and also it, especially during um, very hot times of the day and hot times of the year, not have to rely so much on their air conditioning, which is, we heard from um, pre, uh, panelists earlier today about, you know, in, in marginalized communities, um, the cost of running an air conditioner is really high. You know, it's a great percentage of um, household income. And so rather than running it to potentially save a life, they'll, they'll forego using it. But there are a lot of unconditioned spaces we mentioned or we heard about warehouses but there's a lot of homes and business small businesses that are unconditioned meaning there's no air conditioning there's a very inefficient fan if anything and so during heat waves extreme heat events or just just hot times of the the year in places that have historically been impacted disproportionately by heat um you know a reflective building material can help eventually save their lives or at least reduce the heat illnesses that could be expected especially amongst our vulnerable neighbors um so i just feel like i'm on my soapbox uh, the narrative is changing for um for cool roofs and cool walls um the crc for years was seen as an energy efficiency related roofing industry organization that is not the case. We were established in 1998 through a diverse um, stakeholder collaboration involving California government agencies, kind of California energy utilities, and national environmental advocacy organizations, and a ton of people in the roofing industry. Their primary reason why the CRC was even created was because the state of California was considering ways of how to essentially prescribe or incentivize the use of, of cool roofs um, as an urban heat island mitigation strategy, but also as a building energy efficiency strategy. Getting it into the building codes, the statewide building standards, which are Title 24, Part 6 is the energy code, Part 11 is the green building code, also known as CalGreen, was a much easier pathway to essentially regulating roof reflectivity um, and so that framed the narrative around cool roofs for many, many, many years, decades, as an energy efficiency measure. So things like this, symposia like this one, where we're talking about all the various solutions, including reflective building materials, in the context of how to mitigate the impact of heat is a trend that we're seeing, and it is an absolutely crucial dialogue um, that um, the public needs to be having. So I don't even know if I answered all the many questions that you had, but. <laughs> I, I wish the state of California had some more money so they could afford a second microphone. That would be really helpful. All right, Matt, I'm talking to you. All right. Um, and so 
what we're trying to do on climate change and protecting human beings and protecting human health, you might say it's where the rubber meets the road. And so our next speaker is going to talk about the road. What are the challenges that we have in doing uh, better climate uh, pavement? I'd like to hear from you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I, I forgot to mention, I, I actually grew up in Chico. Uh, I remember the day it was 121 degrees, and I went to school in unair conditioned schools and lived in a, an air conditioned house up there. So it uh, it affects you. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that we were looking at, there was a part of the original idea for cool pavement was actually to reduce global warming potential through uh, reduced air conditioning energy use. Uh, and, and that was important, the early work done by the Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Laboratory. Uh, when we did a study with them five years ago, six years ago, uh, and we looked at it and we also incorporated the renewable energy portfolio uh, what we found was that the um, electricity use uh, was not the big deal from the air conditioning, um, from cool pavement, from the cool pavement part, um, because the cool pavement didn't really have that much of an effect on the on the buildings. A little bit of an effect on the lighting, but it was extremely, extremely small. Um, and in fact, in Fresno, uh, which we modeled. Um, in the winter, it's also reflective in the winter, and we heat with natural gas, so we actually are increasing global warming in the winter because of the natural gas use. Small differences. So the conclusion of that was not that we shouldn't be looking at cool pavement. It was, and in particular, I had some conversations with my my colleague George Van Weiss, who just died of cancer in November, uh, and we both agreed that really the focus that we wanted to focus on was human thermal comfort. Uh, not the electrical energy and not the global warming potential, because that was, we do have the reflective uh, help from the, the radiative forcing, but we know that some of the current materials that we're using are also, which are resin and epoxy based and have titanium dioxide and don't necessarily last that long, are also pretty impactful. Uh, but we have this human thermal comfort issue, which is a you know critical issue for uh, climate resilience. Uh, we've just proposed a new national center to study this, in fact. Um, I hope we get it and find out in January. Uh, human thermal comfort. So, a um, couple is, you know, that it, straight up, we have uh, increased discomfort, increased mortality. Uh, it reduces active transportation. Uh, people don't want to get out when it's, you know, the pavement's burning hot and they're really hot. Um, so, we really need to find a way and really understand how cool pavements affect human thermal comfort. I think that's the biggest issue and, and in a very localized, uh, particularly a localized area. Um, so um, we also know that there's two phenomena for this. Uh, one is the, um, the, the air is hotter when you have a lower albedo pavement. The other is that as we increase albedo, some of that shortwave radiation is also reflecting back into the body. So the human thermal comfort models of, uh, of uh, human body temperature are accounting for both of those. Uh, right now, we don't know what is potentially a, a, an optimal albedo that is balancing the change in air temperature and the uh, reflected radiation that a human on the pavement is getting from the from the from the higher albedo from the higher reflectivity. Um, so those are a couple of things. I think we need to figure out much better the science of the human thermal comfort uh, uh, with those two phenomena. I do remember going to San Francisco, which is where we went once in a while. We'd get a trip to get out of the heat, and it was about sixty degrees cooler down there. And going to Justin Herman Plaza which is all concrete, very reflective. And it was and the air was cool, but we were getting the, the reflective radiation. So I think balancing those and doing the science is extremely important to really, uh, you know, a given asphalt pavement right now, we need to have higher reflectivity, but how high and how do we balance that? The second thing is how do we find new materials that are gonna have lower environmental impact so that we get that radiative forcing benefit, which we know is there, but we're emitting less CO2 equivalent and less CO2 when we're producing 
the reflective materials. We do have, uh, again, funding is, I will, I will put out this plea another time, funding has been very sporadic in this area, uh, but we cooperate quite a bit with our colleagues in China who have actually given us a lot of the information about what the materials are. Um, they're able to ex extract that information from the manufacturers a little better than we are. Um, and our colleagues in France, we're working with, uh, uh, we have a Chinese student working with a French university on bio-based binders to replace the asphalt that are more transparent and allow the natural re aggregate stone is very reflective, most of it, particularly if we pick the stone right. If we can let that stone how should I say, shine through, <laughs> let it shine, uh, that's probably the direction that we're, we're trying to aim to, to get to all the benefits, but with less uh, impactful um, materials. Um, I'm not sure if you're gonna ask me the question about health benefits later, or that's a second round of questions. Okay. Um, but maybe I'll step over here because I have a question for you. So uh, the study that you did with Ronan Levinson and Haley Gilbert of Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, uh, it said that even the the, pavement, the reflective pavements that are around today had 12 times the GHG benefit by reflecting sunlight back into space. And there was a second part. Yeah, there was, and true, uh, there was a second part to that, that they had about 10 times the global warming potential from producing the materials. And that was the part that our study looked at for the first time is that our Ronan and our other colleagues had never looked at the materials production side in the global warming. So they, we do get a bit more radiative forcing, but we cancel a lot of that out with our current uh, epoxy-based materials. So I'm gonna go over to Kristen. Hey, Kristen, at LA County, if you were to put down a cool pavement surface, let's say in like Covina or some unincorporated area, could you stipulate what the GHG content of that material could be? So we, we have many contracting roles and scopes of work. <laughs> we can go back and forth with attorneys, but we can go, go in and out of but yeah, so we 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 have a neighborhood level cool pavement demonstration. And I, I think I'll just reiterate the point that we're super early days, but we also have to fly this plane and 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 build it too at this particular moment. So I think we have a lot of unanswered research questions, but setting those sort of standards, it's a process that we are actually doing on all kinds of infrastructure that really the federal infrastructure money has sparked, as the Board of Supervisors have said. We need to meet our additional goals besides building good infrastructure we need to meet equity goals we need to meet resilience goals we need to meet climate goals at the same time so we're currently in the process of establishing a criteria that i hope spills into all of our infrastructure spending could, could they certify that it's carbon neutral and then you will buy it if it were carbon neutral? sure that's some i'm sure that's something we could do <laughs> okay john yeah so uh, I'll ask the, the folks out here, how many know what the letters uh, EPD mean, EPD? So an EPD is, and this is part of our message that we're putting out to local government right now as well. So an EPD is called an environmental product declaration. It's, it's basically the equivalent of what we did in our, in our study when we were looking at this. Um, so an EPD is a, a life cycle assessment from the cradle to the gate, meaning everything upstream and all the processes up to when the material leaves the gate of the manufacturer. Uh, we started working with Caltrans six years ago and talking about environmental product declarations. They've been used in Europe for about that amount of time in certain countries, but basically it is that statement. It is the equivalent of the nutrition label on, on your cereal box, except it's global warming, ozone, uh, 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 10 other uh, US EPA um, criteria. And so Caltrans is piloting, uh, uh, was the first in the country to pilot, pilot requiring environmental product declarations for pavement products. Uh, Colorado passed their uh, mirror legislation uh, this year in March. And two weeks ago, we've been working with federal government for about six years. And two weeks ago, federal government announced the Buy Clean program, which is going to start requiring uh, EPDs for all civil infrastructure materials that involve federal dollars. 
So what we're advocating is to, and, and the whole industry, paving industry is gearing up and, the, and producing EPDs now. The gap that we have is for these other materials. So talk coming out of our, our, our program, talking to you, Jonathan, down there in LA five years ago, uh, I was talking to manufacturers and saying, are you guys ready to start producing EPDs? So I think we need to put the squeeze on, on folks and that is the nutrition label. And, and then you start to see what, what those things are. Thank you so much, John. And that's exactly right. It's, it's if we, we really analyze the, the full life cycle of these products and we look at their greenhouse gas potential and there are levers that government has to be able to to implement that so i'm going to turn to sarah sarah are there ways to have this epd or like an environmental impact label uh for uh cool roofing materials as well and have there been discussions along those lines in the cool roof world so another disclaimer that is outside the scope of the CROC. We're only focused on surface radiative properties, but um, I think it's an important discussion and it certainly is being discussed, particularly in the paint industry. <laughs> They're subject to a lot of regulations. Um, so paints are primarily for exterior walls or interior walls um, and other architect what they call architectural coatings um, used in industry, residential and commercial sectors. Um, but roof coatings, which is not paint, you don't want to make the roofing guys mad. It's a coating. <laughs> um, I believe are also subject to a, a bunch of regulations and we're probably having those discussions now. But the CRC, um, what we're charged to do, that's beyond the, the scope of what we're talking about um, in the cool roofing and cool wall community. Well, I want to come back to you with another question. One thing that you referenced earlier is that there's like a wonderful beneficial bystander effect with cool roofs, that it not only cools the building underneath it, that's how it's regulated in the state of California. So it's kind of irrelevant that it has these other great co-benefits of sending shortwave radiation to, into space. We can't look at that. It has a co-benefit of keeping a whole neighborhood cooler or the area cooler, saving water. We can't look at that. But could you talk about some of those other co-benefits associated with cool roofs? Well, there's a multitude. You just named a couple of them. I mean, there's a ripple effect, a positive ripple effect that comes when you, um, you know, lower the cooling demand of a building. You, if it's a conditioned building, you use less um, energy, which means it saves um, money for the, the, the building occupants or the building owner. Um, it has a positive impact on, um, or I should say, helps to decrease the generation of greenhouse gas emissions here in California, very germane to the discussions um, earlier today with CAISO and, or Cal ISO and the Energy Commission with respect to grid reliability. So, you know, a, a reduction in um, building energy as well as vehicles that are driving in hot neighborhoods and having to um, use more air conditioning. Air conditioning produces waste um, as an exhaust um, byproduct, and that just amplifies the already existing heat problem in a lot of our um, marginalized communities. Um, another, I think someone else had mentioned it on an earlier panel about when you lower outdoor um, ambient air temperatures, you slow the production of ground level ozone, which is a key ingredient. And in, it was you that mentioned it. Sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> Uh, so ozone is an ingredient in smog formation. So when you have lower outdoor ambient air temperatures, you have um, an improvement in air quality. The, also the reduction in energy use um, also helps reduce the need to turn on dirty peaker plants. So in our disadvantaged communities where a lot of these polluting fossil fuel um, um, power generation plants are, you know, not having to bring them online, for peak periods is a benefit to the, the communities that are disproportionately burdened by um, air quality issues. Uh, oh my gosh, there's so many more. <laughs> um, but those are, those are the primary ones uh, associated with the impacts of um, cool roofs. Cool walls have the same, um, same benefits um, in terms of um, energy cost savings and reducing indoor and outdoor air temperatures and slowing the formation of smog. 
So John, could you help us understand, you, you've mentioned the need for additional research dollars. Could you maybe be a little bit more specific about what that might look like and then a little bit about some of the emerging technologies that you're aware of? Thank you, and thank you for asking, Jonathan. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing that we really need, uh, and we've done this, we've recently done this for permeable pavements, which are one of our, not so much in California because they really need water dumped into them to get the evaporative cooling, uh, but working with our, our uh, um, Chinese um, colleagues, Shanghai, heat, heat, heat problems, mm -hmm. and la high humidity, massively high humidity. Um, so uh, so what we've done is we've produced a roadmap and this is this is available if you google uh permeable pavement roadmap you'll see our roadmap which was put together from a workshop that we did five years ago uh, and we brought together state local and federal government uh we brought together the three what we thought we were two tribes we found out a third tribe showed up uh, we thought we were the pavement people and the stormwater people. It turned out that there was a third tribe, which is the flood control people. But you have to bring together the stakeholders because of uh, to, to really put this together. So I think the first thing is we need a roadmap for research, development, and implementation. That will then lay out the stepwise, the projects, estimate the dollars, and you can really put a program together. But in, in particular, some things that I think should be in that roadmap one is uh, uh, finding better materials, I already mentioned that, same benefits or better optimized properties uh, for the human thermal comfort in particular. The, gl the global, you know, the citywide heat island is definitely an issue, but I think um, we can, we should really be focusing first and foremost on the localized, the park, the things that we were hearing in the previous, the park, the parking lot, uh, this, the, this, the uh, playground where people are actually on that pavement and uh, and the vulnerable populations are on that pavement. Um, uh, there are other alternatives out there right now to painting it, uh, not painting, coating. Um, and I will mention, by the way, that the uh, asphalt roofing industry, we work with asphalt, of course, and the roofing industry is part of that is moving towards that. It's kind of the, those are the leading edges of the refining industry. Uh, in terms of doing that. Um, I think uh, requiring the EPDs and starting to build that database, and that's the program that we're doing for paving materials at the state level right now, uh, really need to bring that down into particularly the big local governments right now and build that database and really get a handle because all the information we have right now and, and, and then start to you know look at that balance of impact and um, ability to get it. I think one of the other, we also need to, Two things that we always advocate is that to make sure we need to move ahead, but we also don't want to do something that we regret. Um, I have worked with a recycled material that was implemented all over the city of Antioch, and only later was the due diligence done and entire blocks of city street are being hauled down to the Hanford hazardous waste plant because the due diligence wasn't done. So I think we need on each of these materials, we need to look at full system and complete life cycle. Part of it is the performance. How long do they last? Because the environmental impact and the costs are dependent on how long we have to replace them. And then, and, uh, you know, I, I would also look, and we've done this for our traditional paving materials and rubberized asphalt, um, is stormwater. You know, when this stuff wears off, what's in it when it goes into our stormwater? Uh, questions like that. And that doesn't mean get started, don't get started and use them where we prioritize. To. I think the last thing in the research is how to prioritize where to use them. Uh, we're going to have a certain amount of dollars. I know local government is not got, you know, boodles of cash laying in the corner and you're going to want to maximize benefit for the cost. So I think that combining life cycle cost with the benefit assessment, life cycle benefit assessment, so that we can prioritize how to get maximum benefit from the dollars. Can I actually take time? So you mentioned a road roadmap. Um, so I just wanted to mention that the Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Energy, has a project right now where the um, the outcome of the project is to develop a, a roadmap or a, de a, um, a deployment plan. Um, for the wide-scale deployment adoption of cool building materials. It's the DOE, so that's what they're primarily concerned with. Um, so 
Um, so specifically cool roofs and cool walls. And through a lot of stakeholder conversations, we've learned um, that, um, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, financial incentives, regulations, and education consumer awareness, public awareness, et cetera. Those are the three direct barriers, but yet also opportunities. And looking outside, looking at inside of California at jurisdictions like the county and city of LA and what they've been doing with respect to um, mandates for cool roofs and hopefully one day cool walls, um, but also looking outside the state of California, the city of Boston implemented a pilot program this year in the context of heat equity and addressing the impacts that a northern city boston is experiencing and getting worse every single year with extreme heat events and it's a cool roof um grant program that's being administered by a nonprofit. it's a pilot program um so they can't really say if it's going to be successful or not but it is um feasible because the department of housing and urban development hud actually has um they provide municipalities and jurisdictions with community block development grants for the installation of cool roofs cool roofs is one of i think of five heat resilient strategies that that federal agency has identified um so this is something that local jurisdictions here in california can do you get cbd um funds you can do things to address heat immediately that aren't going to be energy intensive like air conditioning. They might not provide immediate relief, but they're going to provide relief a lot sooner than um, a mature tree canopy. So ultimately, what I do want to say, though, is that taking a holistic approach, that is going to be the most important thing. Local jurisdictions, you got to look at every single tool in the toolbox. So we're looking at trees, vegetation, cool pavements, cool walls, cool roofs, cooling centers and ways to work with the community to uh, implement solutions that make sense for that neighborhood that's being impacted um, severely by the impacts of heat and not just extreme heat but the heat that these communities have been living with for decades and decades and decades due to racist policies so with that i'll hand it back Kristen, and, and if you're listening uh, uh, online, uh, please enter your questions into the, the Q&A function. And if you're here in this room, uh, we have the ability to also get questions asked. Um, so uh, LA County, what's next when it comes to reflective surfaces? Uh, I heard that the 3M company now has a a steep slope shingle that has an SR of 0.3. I mean, you're at 0.25 now. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, we are um, we're open to all the approaches to meet those quantitative targets of this. We need to convert a lot of surfaces, and we actually have pretty good data on what our surface that the surfaces are in LA County because we have a. Uh, a tax measure related to stormwater, and we know really a quite fine grained detail what uh, what our surfaces are. Um, so the the um, the cool the neighborhood scale cool pavement deployment that you referenced in Covina, um, we it was a one year deployment, and there's now at least two studies um, published that that um, analyze. Um, the benefits and opportunities of what, what to do next. Um, so I think we're, but I will echo the importance of the, like a research agenda because our policymakers, our board of supervisors and their staff ask us, what is the most effective solution? We know that we as government are not gonna have, a local government not gonna have enough money to respond to the level of need. So it's being smart about where and how and addressing multiple um multiple needs multiple benefits at one time so i think whatever we do um that it has to check a couple boxes has to be multi-benefit sarah did such a great job because i was going to make i was that's why i referenced how i worked at the air resources board because i wanted to make sure that we talked about air quality um because i am really concerned around um extreme heat and air quality and when those those when you have an air quality alert day and an extreme heat day. Um, so that that is all that we're doing. We need to do all the things is is my my answer there. And we can probably bump up our cool roofing uh, 
reflectivity levels. Um, I'm happy to now entertain questions of Taylor. Wonderful. So we have a question from Nicole Wong. She's joining us from the Green Line Institute in person today. How can more jurisdictions adopt LA County's cool roofs ordinance? Is this gaining steam elsewhere? And then a second part to that question, how cost effective are cool roof materials? What efforts are underway to target these solutions to affordable housing? I think I can answer that question. So if, if, if I might, is that acceptable? So um, there are climate zones within the state of California and the California Energy Commission does have some cool roof uh, building standards that they've assigned in Title 24, Chapter 6, for different climate zones within the state. And it's divided between steep slope roofs, which are typically residential roofs, and then uh, uh, low slope roofs, uh, which are mainly commercial or apartment buildings. And there are different standards for each. Um, typically, the, the flat, flatter roofs have a much higher solar reflectance value assigned to them, while the steep slope roofs have a, have a lower uh, albedo associated with them uh, in these standards. Um, when a jurisdiction wants to go to a higher standard, it needs to go through a motion of its public body. So let's say LA County. Uh, put together a motion and it pulled together a cost benefit analysis of doing the more robust um, cool roofs. And then that was submitted to the California Energy Commission for their consideration. Um, that analysis on cost benefit has already been performed. So it's not very hard to do. And so it does take uh, the movement of some paper with the California Energy Commission. Did I do okay? Okay. The the interest level. Um, I will say we don't get a lot of we we get a lot of inquiries about a lot of different things from other jurisdictions. I will not say I've heard a lot of clamor on this particular issue. We do have a resource library where we put up model codes and ordinances. So it's it's all there packaged up in our resource library, which is where I should have pointed you when you emailed me the other day. I forget it. So because we had it on our we had it in another place in our website. Anyways, um. And I will say that so we just in general of how we coordinate and encourage um, the 88 cities of Los Angeles County to help advance the regional county goals on sustainability, which inherently requires um, participation from our, our 88 uh, cities that um, we uh, so we hosted a, a bi monthly um, cities workshop on whatever issues we feel are, are pressing. Um, and we did a, a recent surveying exercise, um, and we, I did not, we did not hear that extreme heat was top of mind for local governments in LA County. So I think we generally have, um, you know, which is I think reflective of, of the greater population. We don't have um, enough of the education of just the basic tools of like, hey, we should be doing doing cool pavements. Um, we, we that is part of your job now, local government. Um, in a new way. So I think we're, I'm generally concerned about, you know, we don't have a, most cities do not have a heat officer, right? There's six in the globe. Um, so I think there's a lot of, before we get to like who's adopted our building, I think we are, are you know, copying our, our, our model ordinances. Uh, we just need to get the team together, <laughs> to, to the team, team local government who cares about heat uh, to the table. We have one more question. Briefly? Yes, we have one more question. And this is kind of in the same vein as the last one. So how do we integrate cooling technologies into existing public works processes? I'm thinking about bike facility upgrades cities often will do in tandem with slurry seal, repaving schedules. Kristen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, it goes back to we 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 are sort of bleeding edge of all this, and we were saying we learned a lot from our neighborhood scale deployment in Covina, um, and I, I think we have a, any time we're adding. A, I, I'm a transportation planner, so I, I don't want really to go off on bike lanes and, and better planning around them. But I think it is that multi-benefit approach, and we sh sure we should be um, redoing our our street surfaces to do 
a lot smarter things and have a lot better outcomes, not just on extreme heat, but, you know, protect vision zero goals, all those things. So um, I would even add, add more to the job than, than what the question implies. John Harvey, last word, you get a sentence. Okay. Um, I, I would really prioritize what we're doing and I would actually prioritize away from blanketing streets. Uh, local government is just beginning to catch up with SB1 funding on years of lack of maintenance and we don't really know the cost. I would use Cal Enviro Screen, which we're using for our complete streets projects and focus on the places where people are on the pavement uh, and, and you build that into the new services as well as maintaining, updating the ones we have. Thank you. Last word, Sarah. Oh. Um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I feel like I'm talked out. It's the end of the day. <laughs> Um, but I, I do encourage everybody to, um, especially local government, to go to coolroofs.org. You can see our online directories of rated roof products and exterior wall products, which is very new. Um, so that just launched this year, um, last month, actually. And I do want to say we also have data, a database of financial incentives and cool roof and wall codes programs and standards. Um, their cool roofs in particular are widely adopted in, um, in standards um, and codes across the U.S. and globally. So looking for, an, for another resource in terms of model codes um, and importantly, financial incentives, I encourage you to go there. There's also educational resources on coolroofs.org um, that educate about um, the impacts of cool roofs and cool walls and how they can be used as mitigation and strategies for um, combating heat. Thanks so much to the OPR and CNRA staff for this convening, because I, I think you heard from me that education is so important. We are we are really just getting started on this, and we but we need to move quickly. And I think we have optimism for that um, from our state legislature and their actions. Thank you. And please give our panelists a, a round of applause. Doing a great job. And thank you. You may exit the stage. And finally, last but not least, we're going to hear from uh, Director uh, Sam Asefa. Thank you, Sam, for a wonderful day. Can you hear me? Great. What an incredible day we have today. Amazing experts from all across um, um, issues that we heard from. Um, it was incredible to have you here in person. A lot of you who stayed with us since online as well. Uh, I want to thank for you uh, the people who participated at this event uh, for. Uh, incredible wisdom and uh, ideas uh, that they provided in terms of addressing extreme heat. Uh, specific uh, and huge thanks to uh, the Department of General Services, uh, Governor Newsom and his team, Assembly Member Luis uh, Rivas, uh, and then the incredible team of the California Natural Resources and this beautiful uh, facility that we gathered today. Uh, and of course, my colleague, colleague uh, Secretary Crawford, uh, for sponsoring uh, the Climate Resolve, I'm sorry, and, and our sponsor, Climate Resolve, uh, and the group um, and the team that was here today, from uh, including Jonathan uh, Parfrey, who is the director of uh, uh, Climate Resolve. I uh, also want to thank, you know, Taylor Carnival, who has been fantastic uh, today uh, uh, with the questions, but also working uh, along with Emily Breslin and uh, uh, Sloan Viola of my team, as well as Amanda Hansen from uh, Natural Resources for really pulling this together, our first symposium on, um, on climate, uh, on uh, extreme heat. Our goal today was twofold. One was to really spotlight uh, the issues around uh, extreme heat, 
We are normally, as uh, humans, we respond when the crisis is here, when the temperature cools down, we forget. So it is our responsibility to actually keep the issue alive and continue to educate ourselves, whether it's the state or a lot of you who engage in this, as well as the communities that are most impacted by this. And the second part, and most importantly, is to look forward to ideas and solutions. And we've heard a lot today from the science, from the community perspective, uh, from uh, new technologies and ideas. Uh, what is incredible about this state is we do have the resources. We have them. We know uh, the issues. We have the will to actually address the most challenging issues that we face specifically around um, uh, climate change. And that partnership across you know, the state from experts, scientists, uh, community groups and organizations at the ground who are working with them, who know the issues better than any of us, most of us who are more on the research and, and sitting in our um, offices in, in developing policies and research, those are the people who are actually are most impacted. And we've heard today from some uh, of the speakers that we need to listen to them around the solutions as well. I just want to note that today is also part of a continuum that we uh, actually decided that we need to really have an ongoing conversation around these issues. You've heard again and again the challenges uh, and, and the dangers and, and the impacts of uh, extreme heat, although it is one of the many issues of the climate change. That's one area that I think we know less about. And I learned a lot even this morning in terms of who is impacted and how they are impacted by it. I think we have a lot to learn from that. So we have to have an ongoing discussion around this. And the symposium is just uh, the beginning. Uh, but the consistent message that we heard today is the uh, incredible um, uh, impact uh, that it has and that the stakes are really high. I heard this morning uh, from the first panel, uh, I think it was Dr. Sasha Gershinov who said, and this stuck with me, he said, the less we adapt or mitigate, the more we suffer. And that is true. And it is important that we actually recognize that in the stakes, the fact that the stakes are higher. But what I am really excited about is actually the solutions are there as well. And more importantly, from where I sit, there has never been a better time or a better place to actually address this uh, incredibly uh, challenging issues around climate change. From the administration, from Governor Newsom to, you heard Assembly Member Rivas and the legislature, uh, they have never come together as they have uh, in this in the in the last couple of budget cycles, and especially you know at this at this this year's budget. And this is not going to come back again. This opportunity in our lifetime, I can guarantee you. I've been in this business of climate planning, um, uh, equity, a lot of these issues for over thirty years. I've never seen a time and an opportunity and a place where a lot of these issues could really be addressed um, head on. Uh, but we have, well, uh, while we still have time, we have a very, very short time uh, in, you know, in the bigger picture of the climate change, but also in our own sort of small world of California in terms of making the big impacts uh, because of the political alignments, the resources that are out there, uh, the time is very short. We have the next you know, five to 10 years to be able to do it. And it is time for implementation. Now, it is time also, as I heard uh, previously, for you to put the government's feet on uh, fire, that we need to act. There is no time. We've planned and planned and planned. Successive governors of California over the last few cycles have really put an elevated climate change as a critical uh, issue for the state. And we're building on that. And our current governor and the legislators are actually doubling down on that. But a lot of the solutions are there. Time to implement and time to get the grants out, as um, some of the speakers say, you know, we need, we, need, we need to get moving. So that's what I'm excited about. There's no time like th this time 
And the fact that, again, we heard it today, it takes not only all of governments, but all of Californians to really address um, address the issues and challenges. So I'm really excited about that. I am um, excited about what is to come as well. And I look forward to engaging with you and we look forward to continuing to engage with you. We'll synthesize the um, and have synapses of the symposium uh, and staff will be pulling that together and we'll be sending it out. And then we'll have continuous events and, and opportunities to actually continue to have this conversation. And we, for that, we really look forward to you, uh, to working with you on addressing these issues. So again, thank you so much for attending our first symposium and more to come. Thank you very much. Thank you.